Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh everyone and good morning. MashaAllah, uh, thank you all for taking time to seek knowledge and waking up on a, early on a weekend uh, to seek sacred knowledge. As the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam informed us that whoever goes out on a path seeking sacred knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates for them the path to paradise. And that this religion is uh, built upon knowledge. That without knowledge, we don't have guidance. And without guidance, we're not able to uh, be successful and truly live in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to. And that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us to live. So in order to accomplish that, we need sacred knowledge. So uh, these gatherings and this time that we spend together, inshallah ta'ala, is of the best time, uh, uh, the best way that we can spend our time in this life. Inshallah, in today's abridged uh, seminar, we're going to be looking at this really beautiful and profound book by Imam al-Ghazali from his Ihya Ulum al-Din the revival of the religious sciences. And this is book four of the 40 books that Imam al-Ghazali authored as part of this collection, the revival of the religious sciences. And in this book, he goes into an explanation and a description of the salah, of the prayer, uh, teaching us uh, and kind of giving us an overview in the book of the outward dimension of the salah as it relates to the validity of the salah and making sure that it's sound according to the outward uh, aspects and dimension. But he focuses primarily uh, and really gives us deeper insights into the meaning of the salah and the state that a person should have when praying. So inshallah in uh, today's seminar we'll have four sessions. Uh, to uh, beginning with this session, the merit of prayer. And then the next session, inshallah, with Shaykh Yahya Rodas, will be on the inner states of prayer. Imam al Ghazali tells us that we should have these internal states uh, within the salah in order for us to truly be experiencing and benefiting from the prayer. And then in session three, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to talk about reverence, khushur having this khushur and reverential awe and presence of heart in the salah. And then finally, with Shaykh Yahya in session four, uh, he will cover the inner meanings of prayer. And that's going to be, inshallah, very valuable. Imam al-Ghazali's, uh, his treatment of that, this, the, the, the state of heart that we should have when we hear the adhan, when we're engaging in wudu, when we begin the prayer and all of the movements of the prayer in the Fatiha, all of the uh, inner meanings that should be present in our heart through all of those various aspects of the Salah. So inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq and we ask Allah that He blesses our time together and that He really allows each and every one of us to walk away with greater presence of heart and a deeper appreciation and realization of the salah, which is the, the pillar of this religion and the greatest means by which we draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah we'll begin with the first session, the merit uh, of the salah, and we'll look at the merit of the adhan, we'll look at the merit of the obligatory prayers and the congregational prayer and we'll look at the merit of prayer in the mosque. And then finally, the merit of sujood, of prostration in this session ta'ala, inshallah ta'ala. So Imam al-Ghazali, he begins his book with this really beautiful introduction. Beginning in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praise belongs to Allah who has immersed his servants in his gentleness and who cultivated their hearts with the lights of this religion and the rituals of worship, who has uh, in his generosity and mercy come down from the throne of majesty to the lowest heaven in order to make himself, uh, uh, to call out to his servants 
So he mentions here this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wasallam that at the end of every night and the last third of every night, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He descends in His mercy and in giving people the opportunity to draw closer to Him and He calls out every night, هَلْ مِنْ دَاعٍ فَأَسْتَجِيبَ له? Is there anyone making dua that I may answer them? وَهَلْ مِنْ مُسْتَغْفِرٍ فَأَغْفِرَ له? Is there anyone seeking forgiveness so that I may forgive them? And that Imam al-Ghazali, he has this beautiful description. He says, look at how the kings of the world, you have to sometimes pay a bribe just to get an opportunity to meet with them. That there is all of this red tape it is extremely difficult to be in the presence and have access to the kings of the world. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened the door and lifted the veil so that we can be close to him and call upon him and enter into his presence at any time. Tamam? So this is a really beautiful, Imam al-Ghazali has this way of uh, showing us the, the depth and the beauty of this opportunity. And this is one of the first things that we have to take into consideration when we're learning about the salah, is that it's not a burden. We cannot look at the salah like it's a burden. Sometimes people say, oh, you have to get up very early. and It seems like a lot, praying five times a day. But in reality, it's the dunya that's quite heavy. It's the world that we want to always have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala support and as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he taught us that when he would ask Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu to make the adhan, he would say, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Give us our comfort through the adhan. Bring what brings us comfort by calling uh, for the prayer. So here Imam al-Ghazali is saying that this is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's mercy and gentleness with us. So he has made the prayers a way that they can draw close to him and be in his presence, whether in congregation or whether a person is alone. And not only that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us that opportunity to be with him. And then he also, in his merciness, in his mercy and gentleness, he has actually made it, uh, uh, he has encouraged us and invited us. In addition, it's an obligation, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in addition to that, he has invited us in a very gentle way and has called us to be with him. So how exalted and glorified is he and how gentle and, and beneficent is he towards us subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then he begins the book with that, that this is a great opportunity and a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he has a breakdown of the book because this is an abridged seminar. We're just going to focus on the topics uh, that I had mentioned, inshallah, and uh, maybe in, a, in another opportunity, we'll be able to go into more depth in the book, but inshallah, this will still be uh, very useful and beneficial. So the first chapter is on the merit of the various aspects of the prayer. The prayer itself, prostration, praying in congregation, the adhan, and so forth. So he starts off with the adhan. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, la yasma'u sawt al-mu'adhini jinnun wala insun wala shay'un illa shahida lahu yawm al-qiyamah. That anything, whether it is the jinn or any human being or anything, even inanimate objects in creation, whenever they hear someone call the adhan, they will testify and bear witness to that on the day of resurrection. So this is a really beautiful thing that whenever you call the adhan, the trees, the animals, other people, other jinn will testify on behalf of that individual and say, I heard this person call the adhan. So Imam al-Ghazali is telling us that the adhan will be a proof for us when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala says in the Noble Qur'an, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا Who is better in speech? In other words, there is none better in speech 
than the one who calls and invites to Allah and does righteous actions. That some of the scholars of tafsir regarding that verse, some say that it's in relation to da'wah, calling people and inviting people to Allah. Other mufassirin said, this is specifically in regards to the mu'adhin. Right? This is the one who invites to Allah, is the one who calls to the prayer. Right? So this is the one who calls people to the salah. That's one of the meanings of this ayah. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam also said, إِذَا سَمِعْتُمُ النِّدَاءِ فَقُولُوا مِثْلَ مَا يَقُولُ الْمُؤَذِّنِ If you hear the call to prayer, then repeat what the mu'adhin says. This is a really beautiful and important sunnah, that when we hear the adhan, uh, we should uh, you know, bring to a conclusion any conversations or pause the conversation that we're having and listen to the adhan and respond. And when the mu'adhan says, you know, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, that we also say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And we'll talk about the inner meanings of that, what should come to our heart when we hear the adhan in session four. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And then when the mu'adhan says, Hayya ala salah, come to the prayer, our response there should be لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. There's no power or ability save by Allah. حي على الفلاح. Come to success. Once again we say لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. That there is no power or ability save by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after the mu'adhin is done and we repeat all of the things that he says, we should say this dua Allahumma rabba hadhihi al-da'wat al O oh Lord, O oh Allah, Lord of this comprehensive supplication, was-salat al-qa'imah, and this prayer that is about to be established. Aati Sayyidina Muhammadan al-wasilata wal-fadila. Give Sayyidina Muhammad the wasila and fadila, this specific rank that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant him. Wa-darajat al-aliyat al-rafi'ah and an exalted and lofty rank. And grant him the praiseworthy station that you have promised him. You do not, you always fulfill your promise. And this is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, who hears the Adhan and responds and says this dua, I will intercede for them. So one of the ways that we seek the intercession of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is by responding to the adhan and also once it is uh, completed to uh, supplicate with this dua. Qala uh, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib. So this is not a, a hadith but it's related to something that uh, was passed down in tradition. He said, Man salla bi ardin fala. Whoever prays in kind of a barren or uninhabited area. And when a person is traveling or out in the woods or in the middle of nowhere or camping or something of that nature, and they pray, even if they're alone, there will be an angel praying to his right and to the left. So then the, 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 the statement continues, فَإِنْ أَذَّنَا وَأَقَامُ So if a person's alone and they just pray, there's two angels on either side praying with them. But if the person calls the adhan and then calls the iqama, صَلَّ وَرَاءَهُ أَمْثَالُ الْجِبَالِ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ There will be a, a, a multitude of angels like the mountains that will pray with that individual person. If they call the adhan an iqama. So this is once again an indication of the merit of the adhan. It's not something to be taken light, lightly. Now I remember uh, Habib Hussein al-Saqaf, uh, may Allah preserve him, who actually, you know, one of the beautiful memories in this masjid is actually being here with, with him. Inshallah, he comes back to America time and time again, fi khayru afia. He was saying that uh, one of the indications of how quickly a person will traverse over the Sirat on the day of resurrection, that they will go over the traverse over hellfire, is according to how quickly they respond to the Adhan. And he said another indication is how quickly 
they reject evil insinuations and, and the insinuations of the nafs or wasawas is the speed with which they reject those things that are displeasing to Allah is another indication of the speed uh, of how quickly they traverse over the sirat. So when we hear the adhan, it's extremely important. We'll have questions, inshallah, at the end. Bi'idhnillah. Jazakum wa kul khair. So uh, this is one of the things that the adhan, and then it's also uh, uh, preparing for the salah. That in order to have presence of heart and really be in a state where you are uh, internalizing the meanings and the states of the prayer, it's not something that just when the uh, uh, Imam says Allahu Akbar and you enter into the prayer, you're there. But it's actually this gradual process that begins with the Adhan, that begins with making wudu. And uh, as we mentioned yesterday at Lighthouse Masjid, that Sayyidina Ali Zayn al Abidin, radiallahu anhu, when he would actually be making wudu, his color would change and he would be t turn yellow. And they would say, what, what is, what's going on? You look different, you look pale, your color has changed. And he would say to them, after making wudu, he says, do you know before whom I am about to stand? So he would be present even in his wudu. So all of these things help facilitate our presence in the salah. Then Imam al-Ghazali takes us to the merit of the obligatory prayers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the noble Qur'an, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا That the prayer is at prescribed times for the believers. And this is related to the obligatory prayers, because those are the prescribed times. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam teaching us the centrality after the shahada, after the testimony of faith, there is nothing greater than the salawat. It is one of the, it is central after the, the shahada, it is the central pillar that holds everything up in our deen. So he tells us salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi khamsu salawatin katabahunna allahu ala al-ibad that there are five prayers that Allah has made obligatory for the servants. فَمَنْ جَاءَ بِهِنَّ وَلَمْ يُضَيَّعْ مِنْهُنَّ شَيْئًا اسْتِخْفَافًا بِحَقِّهِنْ كَانَ لَهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدٌ أَنْ يُدْخِلَهُ الْجَنَّةِ So whoever establishes them, the five prayers, and does not lose any of or does not uh, leave aside any of its rights out of thinking little of the prayer, then that person has an oath with Allah that he will enter him or her into paradise. If a person establishes the salah and does not, you know, oh, I'll pray it later, or does not think that they're unimportant, and they literally give their lives, and uh, uh, that they construct their lives around the salawat. And that's what we have to do. It's not something that we fit into our day, but really that the salawat are the pillars of our day, and everything else is fit in around them. And that we establish them properly and that we give time to learning the reality and the inner states and meanings of the salah. This is, this is the purpose of our life. And whoever does that, the Prophet ﷺ says that they have an oath with Allah that he will enter them into paradise. In other words, it's a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith continues. So that's the case of the one who establishes them properly. And whoever does not pray these five prayers, he has no oath with Allah. He has no covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah wills, he will punish that person. And if Allah wills, he can enter them into paradise. This is an indication that they're Muslim, but we don't even want to be in the situation of, of danger. We don't even want to risk it. And as Imam al-Ghazali is going to teach us, inshallah ta'ala, not only do we not want to risk it, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he said, وَجُعِلَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِ فِي الصَّلَةِ The most beloved thing that Allah gave me and placed in my heart in the life of this world is the salah. So that's an indication of 
all of the various degrees of nearness and the gifts and the blessings and the mercy and the openings that a person can receive through the salah. And this is something the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he established and you see that it saturated the souls of the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhu. You know, one of the things I always think about is that they didn't have alarm clocks. So it's like, how do you get up for, you know, not for them, it wasn't even Fajr. Fajr wasn't even an issue. It was like Qiyam al -Layl. You know, they were getting up in the, the middle of the night on a regular basis and they were praying. And it's something that was instilled in their hearts of the reality of the Salah. Now that is the Sahaba, but when we seek this type of knowledge and whoever is sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and puts forth an effort, uh, those same treasures are open to us as well. That's why even to this day you find people, the, the greatest thing in their life is the Salah. And as Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, or uh, it might even be attributed to others, that if the, the people of the world, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu said, one of the, the, the reasons that I, one of the only reasons that I love to remain in this world is, uh, uh, and one of the reasons that he mentioned was the night prayer, Qiyam al-Layl. And other Salihin, they said, if the kings of the world, the people who love luxury and they vie with one another and compete with one another about the things of the dunya, and they want to have all of these different experiences and uh, enjoy the, 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 they think that their joy, they're trying to acquire as much of it as they can in the life of this world. If they knew the joy that we experienced in Qiyam al-Layl, they would try to take our lives in order to steal it from us, if they could, but they can't. You know, this has a very special door that you have to go through. And that door is ubudiyah, servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recognizing that this is far better than, you know, very superficial and fleeting worldly things. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the ahadith continue. This is one of my uh, favorite and it's, it's, often, uh, it's often referred to with regards to the salawat that he said sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, مثل الصلوات الخمس كمثل نهر عذب غمر بباب أحدكم يقتحم فيه كل يوم خمس مرات. The likeness of the prayer, if you really want to understand the salah and what it does and some of the spiritual benefits within the salah, it is like a sweet and uh, deep uh, a river or stream that flows right at the door of one of your houses. Imagine right before you walk out of your house and there's this beautiful, clear, sweet, cool stream that uh, uh, is right in front of your house. And that, that person, he then swims or immerses himself in that river or that stream five times every day. فَمَا تَرَوْنَ ذَلِكَ يُبْقِي مَنْ دَرَنِهِ would you then see that that person has any, uh, uh, any filth or anything that's unclean that remains on him? If he's swimming in this river, this very you know, life-giving and vibrant and beautiful river, and he swims in it and immerses himself in it five times a day, would that person have any dirt? And obviously the answer is no. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, فَإِنَّ الصَّلَوَاتِ الْخَمْسِ تُذْهِبُ الذُّنُوبَ كَمَا يُذْهِبُ الْمَاءُ الدَّرَنْ He says the five prayers, they remove sins the way that that water removes uh, filth and things that are unclean. But once again, this goes back to why we're studying this book and the importance of understanding this deen in the fullest sense and really seeking sacred knowledge that is uh, comprehensive of the outer and inner dimensions of these acts of ibadah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, that the salah prevents one from vile and evil deeds and wrongdoing. So someone might say, I know someone who prays regularly and so forth, but why is it that uh, they, they are not refraining from wrongdoing and from vile actions. And, and oftentimes, you know, especially young people, they'll notice that, that there might be something that's not fully aligned. 
that a person's actions and a person's state do not really seem to be indicating the same thing. And the ulama of the inner science of the heart, they say that that's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse is referring to the reality of the salah. It's not just standing up and going through the motions, but the reality of the salah is meant to be transformative. That if someone enters into the presence of the King of Kings subhanahu wa ta'ala, someone's heart is before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are knocking at his door and they are witnessing him as one is meant to. The salah is transformative. It's a, it's a powerful experience. So it's not something that uh, is just meant to be outward. And there were people even in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said that they, from these people you'll see in the future that you will find people who their salah will make you embarrassed about the state of your own prayer, their outward salah. Their siyam will make you feel like you're falling short in your own siyam. But it's a, a merely an outward reality because those people then start just like Iblis. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. They start to think that they're better than others. They start to think that they're better than others. Look at my salah, look at my siyam. But it's just an outward form. If you had the reality of the salah, you would, it would humble you. You would not look down on others. You would realize and begin to witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings upon you and His mercy, and you would desire good for others. So it's not the outward form, once again, it's a balance. It is both. It is both. That the sharia, I remember hearing this from, from Shaykh Yahya, I wrote it down, that the sharia is like the outer shell. And in order to get to the pearl inside, you have to have the sharia. You have to have the outward dimension of this deen, but then the spiritual reality is the pearl inside. So you need the shell to protect the pearl. But we also, we, we want to get to the pearl. We want the, the, the fruit, the essence of, uh, uh, of that act of ibadah, of that act of ibadah. Now, so here the Prophet ﷺ is saying that these prayers, they remove sins, just like if a person immerses himself in this river, this flowing river, and that they will be uh, cleansed of all dirt and impurities. And this is also uh, further, uh, further emphasized or supported by another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, also narrated by Imam Muslim. إِنَّ الصَّلَوَاتِ الْخَمْسِ كَفَّارَاتٌ لِمَا بَيْنَهُنْ مَجْتُنِبَةِ الْكَبَائِرِ That the five daily prayers are expiations. They expiate, they remove the sins that occur in between them as long as a person avoids major sins. So this is an indication that this refers to the minor sins. Right, that the salawat, uh, uh, they remove and they cleanse us of those sins. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he also said, بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَ الْمُنَافِقِينَ شُهُودُ الْعَتَمَةِ وَالصُّبْحِ لَا, يستطيع لا يستطيعونهما. He said the difference between us and hypocrites. Once again, it's really interesting and it's undeniable how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made the prayer and congregation and praying on time the, the indication of the soundness of a person's iman. And the lack of that in, in an indication of hypocrisy. billah. So he says, وسلم, that the difference between us and the hypocrites is uh, being present for the isha and subah prayer. So atama is isha and subah is also referred to oftentimes as fajr. That those two prayers especially, uh, the, that the hypocrites are not able to pray them. So if we have a deficiency, and especially those two prayers, we have to make an effort to rectify that. And the Prophet ﷺ also said it in another hadith. That أثقل الصلاة على المنافقين صلاة العشاء وصلاة الفجر That the, most, the heaviest, the weightiest that weighs them down, prayers uh, for the hypocrites is صلاة العشاء 
and Salatul Fajr. And then what did he say? So he said, وَلَوْ يَعْلَمُونَ مَا فِيهِمَا لَآتَوْهُمَا وَلَوْ حَبْوَا If they knew what Allah gives in those two prayers, they would come to them even if they had to crawl. Imagine someone can't even walk and all they can do is crawl. If they knew what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives in those prayers, if they had to crawl from their home to attend, they would do so. Of the, the mercy and the blessings and the gifts and the veils that are removed from the hearts. And many of the great Salihin, we're going to get to the Masajid shortly, but it's all interconnected. They said that uh, just they, they received certain uh, openings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a presence of heart, a greater degree of witnessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes and his blessings, kind of, uh, you know, uh, attaining higher levels of certitude. He said, we attained certain gifts from Allah related to that in the masajid, that even if we were somewhere else and we strived very hard in ibadah, we wouldn't have received the same portion that we got in the masjid. Because there's something about the mercy that a person receives, you know, particularly in those places that are dedicated to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or gatherings where people come together collectively to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Imam al-Ghazali is now warning us of the danger of falling short. So he says that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَنْ لَقِيَ اللَّهَ وَهُوَ مُضَيِّعٌ لِلصَّلَاةِ لَمْ يَعْبَ إِلَّهُ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ حَسَنَاتِهِ Whoever meets Allah and that person has lost the prayer, that they have not established it, that they have been totally neglectful of the prayer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cares not for any of his other good deeds. A person meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they might have a lot of other good deeds, but if they have been neglectful of the salah, Allah cares not for those other hasanat. He also said, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, as-salatu imadu deen the prayer is the pillar of the religion, holds everything else up. فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ هَدِمَ الدِّينَ Whoever leaves it or is neglectful of it has destroyed his religion. Everything else is going to fall apart. It's on a very, very weak foundation without the salah. One of the companions, he asked the Messenger of Allah وسلم, what is the most beloved and meritorious action? What is the best action that's most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And he said, The prayers in their prescribed times. Praying on time. Some of the salihin, the way that they, and, and this might sound like an oversimplification, but actually it's really beautiful if you think about it. This really helps us prioritize what it's all about. Some of the salihin, they said, our lives consist of praying the five prayers and waiting to die and meet Allah. It shows us what it's really about. And everything else is secondary. Um, there are many other uh, hadith uh, about that. Uh, We'll end with this one and then we'll move on to the next point, inshaAllah ta'ala. وَقَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَنْ تَرَكَ صَلَاةً مُتَعَمِّدًا فَقَدْ بَرِئَ مِنْ ذِمَّةِ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ Whoever neglects the prayer on purpose, purposefully, intentionally, that person has absolved themselves from the protection of Muhammad sallallahu and from his community. وَالْعِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ So this shows us, this, it's really not something that we can uh, take lightly at all. But after the shahadatain, this is the most important thing that we have to establish. And we have to uh, uh, properly give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his due with what relates to this act of ibadah. The next uh, section is the merit of praying in jama'ah. And we touched on that a little bit. But here Imam al-Ghazali gives us some ahadith related to that. That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Salat al jamaati tafdulu salat al fadhi bi sab'in wa ishirina daraja. That praying in congregation 
is more is more superior to praying individually by 27 degrees which can be understood as 27 times better than praying alone so if a person prayed for example shall we pray salatul dhuhr together if a person prays in jama'a salatul dhuhr and they went and prayed it by themselves 27 times then if they did it 27 times it might equal the salat in jama'a so it shows that it is multiplied many, many times over and that it's not something that we want to miss out on or, you know, think lightly of, oh, no, I'll just pray by myself. You know, and even in our homes as families, it should be a culture that we uh, cultivate in our homes that we pray together as a family. You know, that we, we have these times and these uh, points where we come together and then praying together in the masjid, you know, uh, especially for men, is something that is uh, even an even greater emphasis, an even greater reward. There are many ahadith related to that. Yeah. One of the ahadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa he said, مَنْ شَهِدَ الْعِشَاءَ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَامَ نِصْفَ اللَّيْلِ Whoever is present for the Isha prayer in congregation, it is as if that person has prayed half of the night. That's a beautiful gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That a person has prayed half the night. And then, if the person shahida subha fakaanama qama laylatan. Aw qama layla kullu. So, and then whoever follows that up with praying salatul fajr or salatul subh in congregation, that makes up the second half of the night. And it's as if the person has prayed the entire night. So a person can come, pray Salatul Isha, go home and sleep all night, and get up for Salatul Fajr, and pray Salatul Fajr in Jama'ah, and it's as if they prayed the entire night. It's that uh, meritorious and important. Now, there are many other ahadith related to that, but even the ones that we covered before in the previous section related to the state of the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, uh, that's something that is uh, significant enough to inform us of the weightiness of Salatul Isha and Salatul Fajr, but also praying in Jama'ah. And that the more we strive to pray in congregation and we commit ourselves to that and, and uh, uh, really are determined, the, the further away from hypocrisy we are, inshallah ta'ala. And the more it's a testimony to the soundness and the trueness of a person's iman. The last section that we'll look at is Fadilat al-Sujood, the merit of sujood. And this is a really beautiful section and there are many ahadith about this particular position in the salah. So we looked at the adhan, we looked at the obligatory prayers, we looked at praying in jama'ah, and then it's as if Imam al-Ghazali is taking us deeper and deeper and highlighting the most important aspects of the salah and within the salah, there is something very distinct and unique about sujood. And it also is the position that is the greatest representation of ubudiyya, complete servitude, and humbling oneself entirely before one's Lord and Creator. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he said, مَا تَقَرَّبَ الْعَبْدُ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ بِشَيْءٍ أَفْضَلَ مِنْ سُجُودٍ خَفِي that a servant draws closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah mighty and majestic, with nothing more meritorious. In other words, there's nothing better in drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than a sujood, a prostration that is hidden. That's in private. That you just maybe at home, you have a particular area where you pray, maybe in your room, or maybe in your, if you have a musalla at home, or a room that's dedicated for prayer, or even a small area that you dedicate for prayer, and no one else is around, and you engage in salah, and you go into sujood, nobody else sees you. That is the thing that brings you closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as Imam al-Junaid, one of the greatest Imams in Islamic history, the, the, the Sayyidul al-Ta'ifa, the Imam of especially in, in preserving 
the sciences of uh, Islamic spirituality and tasawwuf. Imam al Junaid, after he passed away, someone saw him in a dream and they say, What has Allah given you? What have you received? What did you find after passing from this world and entering into the barzakh? And he said, All of the various terminologies and different sort of uh, things that people kind of might compete with each other about or think that is so important and so significant. He said all of that kind of dissipated and what I found that benefited me the most is two rak'ahs that I would pray in the middle of the night. That's what I found with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's one of the greatest imams. It doesn't mean that those other things aren't important but it goes to show if that's really what he's highlighting, what he found with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it's, it's very valuable and weighty. The Prophet وسلم, was once asked, and this is another one of these really uh, kind of uh, central and foundational ahadith, that one of the Sahaba, Sayyidina uh, Ka'b, uh, Sayyidina Rabi'a ibn Ka'b al-Aslami, radiyallahu anhu, he was serving the Prophet وسلم, and he brought him his wudu water. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he asked him, he said, Sal. he gave him the option, he said, ask for whatever you want. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, I ask you for your companionship, for your murafaqa, to be in your company in paradise. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, do you have any other request? Sometimes the lover is tested. Any, anything else? And then he was, mashallah, he said, who was that? That's it. That's everything. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave him the, the, the way, the formula, in order to be granted that. He said, sujood. Assist me with your nafs and assist me over your nafs or in order to do that, with what? With abundant sujood. Through abundant sujood, it becomes more accessible uh, to be in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam in paradise. So if that was the only hadith about sujood, it would be enough. That that's the way to be with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam in paradise. Yeah. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said, إِنَّ أَقْرَبَ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ مِنَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَىٰ أَنْ يَكُونَ سَاجِدًا This is a hadith narrated by Imam Muslim. The closest a servant is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when he is prostrating or when she is prostrating. That is the closest that a person is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember what Imam al-Ghazali said at the beginning of the book that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his gentleness and in his mercy, he has made himself accessible in a way that the kings of this world can never, never make themselves accessible to people. And that through his gentleness and mercy, he has opened that door and removed the veil so that people can be close to him and seek from him at any time. And uh, uh, this is also the meaning of the verse of the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and make sujood and draw close. That that is the closest you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah describes the Sahaba in the Quran and He describes the nur, the light that emanates from their faces and He ties it subhanahu wa ta'ala to the sujood. So he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said anything that they're, the light that emanates from their face is from their dhikr. The light that emanates from their face is from their siyam. The light that emanates from their faces, from all of the various acts of ibadah, definitely illuminate one's heart. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, As-sujood. Simahum fi wujuhihim min athar sujood That their traits, the radiance, can be witnessed and they can be recognized from the effect, from the impact of their sujood. That that nur emanates from them, from the impact uh, of the sujood. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Wasallam, his great-grandson, his great-grandson, the son of Imam al Hussein Radiallahu Anhu Wa Arda, Sayyidina Ali Zayn al Abidin ibn al Hussein, that he would, uh, that he would make sujood a thousand times a day. 
that he would pray so abundantly that he would perform a thousand sujood a day, which is why he's known as Zain al Abidin, the ornament, the beauty of the worshippers, because he because of his sujood. And he's the, the great grandson of the Prophet وسلم, and they are the greatest uh, exemplars and inheritors of the way of the Prophet. And then there are many stories that Imam al Ghazali then mentions of the Salihin, and we'll end with a few of them. That Kana Yusuf ibn Asbat Yaqul, that Yusuf ibn Asbat, he would say to uh, some of the, the young people, he would say, Ya Ma'ashar al Shabab, oh young people, Badiru bis Sihati qabl al Maradi, Fama Bakia Ahadun Ahsuduhu illa Rajulun, Yutimu Rukuahu wa Sujuda. He says, you know, take advantage of your health before your sickness. Because there is no one on the face of the earth that I envy, and this is not a haram envy. Right? This is ghibt, right? ghibta, that I envy in this way that what the opportunity that they have, that I wish that I had, except a person who is able to perform the ruku' and sujood completely and perfectly. That one of the ways that you show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the, the health and the ability to do so is actually using that uh, health and that ability in ibadah, in the ruku' and in the sujood. There might be some people for a health reason or if they get elderly, that becomes more difficult. So he would say to young people, take advantage because the sweetness of sujood is the only thing that I envy anyone in this world over, that they're able to do that. <clears throat> Another one of the pious predecessors. He said, That the most beloved trait or characteristic that a servant has, that is the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that that person loves to meet Allah. That is the most beloved thing. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he seals our lives, that when we leave this world, that he seals it with a husnul khatima, a good end, and that he gives us at that moment the greatest love and yearning to meet him, Ya Arham al Rahimin. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet them. So this is what he's referring to. So that's the first part. That the, the moment, the time, the trait that's most beloved to Allah is loving to meet Him. And the time that the person is closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when they prostrate into sujood. And then finally, that the closest a person is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when they are in sujood. So abundantly supplicate when you are in sujood. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are in sujood to fulfill your needs and to give you what you are seeking because that is the moment that you are closest to him subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah we'll finish here wa sallallahu ta'ala ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen maybe we'll just take five minutes for questions and then we'll take a brief break uh, and transition to session two inshallah ta'ala yes Ah, mashallah, that's a very good question. So if you're praying at home, it is always better to call the adhan yourself. And even though, you know, a recording or YouTube, that's very nice. Uh, according to what I understand from my teachers, that's not an actual replacement for the adhan. So to actually call the adhan oneself is better. Even if you're at home, even if you're alone. Yes. And then we'll see the sisters. Yeah, please. Yeah, mashallah, that's a very good question. So uh, in the salah, 
there are some slight uh, differences of opinion among the ulama. Uh, some ulama really emphasize that in the sujood, you only say the duas from the Quran and the sunnah, or that that's most highly emphasized. Uh, another thing is that because we're in the salah uh, and uh, the supplications and the that we should make those du'as in Arabic. So generally when we're in the salah, we should stick to the du'as from the Qur'an and from the sunnah and the du'as that we memorize that are in Arabic. And then outside of the salah, and we're making general du'a, that can be in any language and so forth. But to preserve the validity of the salah, uh, that, that, that is a, the, the better approach, just to keep it from the Qur'an and from the sunnah, what one knows in Arabic. Shaykh yeah, that's also the case for Nafil prayers as well. Uh, about dua in Arabic, in sujood. No. Yeah, for, that's, that's the case for... You can make it in another language in your heart, but whatever you verbally say in the salah, it should be in Arabic. Yes. Mm. MashaAllah. Mm. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Beautiful. Two very good questions. So, as salatu liyama wa qitiha, that hadith indicates the prescribed times. There's another hadith that talks about the merit of praying in the earlier time over the end of the prescribed time. So there's obviously a window, uh, but the, that praying at the beginning of the time is superior to praying at the end of the time. So generally speaking, in addition to praying in those times, that there is an added fadl, an added merit of bringing the salah uh, and praying it in the earlier times. So then his second question was, uh, you know, praying in jama'ah, should I pray at home with my wife, for example, if there's no one else for her to pray with, or should I pray in jama'ah at the masjid? I actually thought about that for a while, and then I heard uh, one of our teachers say something beautiful. He said that many of the salihin, out of their concern and their, uh, their commitment to praying in jama'ah in the masjid, is that they would pray at home with their families and then pray in jama'ah at the masjid as well. So that's a way where you can you know, also pray in jama'ah with, with your, your wife and your family. And then in addition to that, the higher road is also to pray in jama'ah at the masjid, to repeat it with, with the jama'ah uh, uh, in the masjid. So uh, the, I thought that was the, I mean, the most comprehensive answer that, that I came across and wanted to share it with you. Anything from the sisters? We'll take one question. Yes. No. No. Ma yeah. Yeah, mashallah. Uh, so sisters calling the adhan, uh, uh, that's, that, that's not the case for sisters, so thank you for asking that. It's, it's, for, it's encouraged for men to do so. Um, and then for sisters praying in congregation, I know that among the, the great imams of the madahib, there are differences of opinion regarding, you know, if a sister can lead other sisters in jama'ah. Uh, and I would just tell people, encourage them to study according to uh, one of the, the four schools and follow uh, whatever, you know, their, that, that school, the position of that school. And there's flexibility with regards to that. Ah, mashallah. Mashallah. Naam. So, so once again, so this is something where a person has to uh, try to uh, really do the best that they can according with their particular circumstances and their own kind of state. So the question is, you know, if it applies to sisters to also pray in congregation and at the masjid and so forth, the Prophet ﷺ didn't prevent that. Uh, but he also encouraged and said that it's better for women to pray at home if they so wish. So it is better, but if they would like to pray, let's say for example, sometimes I have no one at home I'm feeling when I'm in the masjid, I'm with the community. That really helps me stay motivated. And if I'm at home, maybe I'm going to be affected by laziness or other things. 
So then a person can really choose based on their own circumstances. Um, but we recognize that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said, it's better to pray at home, but there were Sahabiyat who prayed in the Masjid. So there's room, there's flexibility there. Jazakumullahu khayran wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for bringing us together to study meanings of our religion that are of the utmost importance. And no matter how much it is that we study about the salah, about the prayer, it is of the utmost, utmost importance that we review regularly and that we always remind ourselves because essentially, as we've been hearing in the first session, is that prayer is the single most important thing of all of the religious life. And it is the touchstone of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is that standard, it is that measure where by which we know whether or not we are close to Allah. We know our relationship to Allah through the prayer. And not only in terms of how serious that we take it outwardly and the degree to which that we make it a priority, but also internally, how we are in our prayer. This is the touchstone whereby which we can determine our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other aspect of this is prayer is life. Prayer is life. And Ustaz Amjad mentioned the narration of one of the Sadaf that life essentially is praying five times a day and waiting to die. There's a lot of truth in that. Because fasting, okay, that we're fasting obligatorily only once a year for the month of Ramadan and whatever super obligatory fast that we do. Hajj and Umrah, we might make that once in our life or maybe a couple other times. Zakat, that we give that once a year if we are above the nisab or zakatable amount. But prayer, we're doing every single day. Every single day. And one of the great benefits of hearing the various ayat verses from the Qur'an and the ahadith, statements of our Prophet ﷺ and the reports of the Salaf, the righteous forebears, is that it encourages us to do what it is that we hear. We hear about the merit of a particular act of worship and it motivates us as believers. And again, we might have heard those same ahadith many times, but we need to hear those regularly. And for this reason, a book like Riyadh al-Salihin, The Gardens of the Righteous of Iman Nawi, which includes so many great statements of our Prophet and of course he begins almost every chapter with verses from the Qur'an. Of the various types of acts of worship that we have in our religious life, this is a book that we should begin and read and start again and read and start again and read and start again and read. And this is one of the very best books of all that we can read with our families on a regular basis. And you might want to have a copy of it right where the place that you pray as a family at home. And what was that mentioned, as that Emjin mentioned is very important, is that we should dedicate a place for prayer in our home. And all of us know, especially if you have kids, how there might be for any given prayer, three or four or five jama'ahs. And kids are praying quickly, want to get back outside. Or kids say that they have homework or they have work to do or whatever else. And um, we want to have one congregational prayer and have a set time for it. And if you can, what I would do is to try to mirror the times with your local masjid. So if prayer is at 1.30 at MCC, try to pray at 1.30 at home, if possible. And if you know for some reason that you have to push it back a little bit for various reasons, have it be calculated. Don't just be like, okay, I'll pray in some time. But if you know in your mind, okay, I can't pray right at 1.30 because whatever, something ends at 1.30, but I'm going to pray at 1.45. Your cooking, your household chores, everything else, you want to revolve around that. Make that a priority. And you will find immense, immense blessings in your life. So we're all in need of these reminders. And this book of the Ahiyah Lumadin, it's book four. And the Ahiyah Lumadin, of course, is an incredibly important work that's encyclopedic in nature. There's 40 volumes, 40 books. This is book four, and it's one of the longest. But in these sessions, we're going to be focusing 
on the inner dimension and how to attain excellence in prayer. And the nature of the Ihyal al-Madin is such, the thrust of it is what is called Ilm Tariq al-Akhirah, the science of the way to the hereafter. And this is something that every Muslim needs. This is just as relevant right now in this moment, 900 plus years after Imam Ghazali as it was in his time. Just as it was relevant to the centuries before him because in Imam Ghazali's articulation of what is known as Ilm Tariq al-Akhirah, the science of the path of the hereafter, he coined this term to indicate what was the reality of the Salaf, what was the reality of those early generations. What was the reality of the life of the Sahaba? What was the reality of the life of the Tabi'een, those who came before? What was their reality? Imam Ghazali coined this term to point to that. And it's a very that far-reaching term that essentially indicates everything that someone needs to prepare for the meeting with Allah. Everything that someone needs to prepare for the meeting with Allah. And so you have the idea of ilm, which is knowledge, but here I like to translate that as science, because here science indicates that something is systematic. And this is, Imam al-Ghazali is an incredibly systematic thinker. And then you have tariq, which is the idea of traveling a path. So there's an internal motion of the heart where you can't just stand still. You have to struggle, you have to strive, you have to do your best to draw near to Allah. And then the akhirah, ultimately this is about the hereafter. Ultimately, this is about the hereafter. And subhanAllah, when we give prayer, it's the importance that we should in our life. When we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there will be nothing greater in our scales than the time that we spent praying for His sake subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more we give preference to prayer, the more that we will then prepare ourselves to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a good state. And when uh, Ustaz Amjad was concluding his session, and this is a story to encourage us all, people that preserve their prayer in life are preserved by their prayer in the hereafter. And someone had just told us a story yesterday about someone who many of these people in this community might know, and that he had mentioned that as a part of his advanced directives when he was admitted into the hospital, that if it, if it reached a state where he could no longer pray, then let him go. If he can't pray, let him go. And they mentioned that, and there was uh, other asked dimensions of this story, uh, but they mentioned as an after that they uh, that took him off the medication and that he was preparing uh, to, to meet his Lord, one of the last things that he did and he wasn't fully conscious, it was that he took his hands like this and then folded them over. And then shortly after that, returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is someone in our time. This is not someone who lived 1400 years ago, 500 years ago, 300 years ago. And so that these stories are there uh, to remind us, subhanAllah, there are people in our time too that are validated by Allah. And one of the greatest ways to be validated by Allah, to be accepted by Allah, is to take your prayer seriously. And so this is why we wanted to review these meanings, uh, first and foremost for our own selves and with all of you, to remind ourselves of how it is that we can attain excellence in prayer. So in this session, we are going to be focusing on the inner states of prayer. And everyone should have the outline and they're listed there for you. And Imam Ghazali that says, essentially, is that you will find many people speaking about the internal states of the prayer, but in a very characteristically Imam Ghazali, a Ghazalian type way, he wants us to understand each one of them with the utmost clarity. And so he lists them, and then he'll explain each one of them briefly, and then talk about how it is that we can attain that in our prayer. So what are the six inner states of prayer that we want to be there? First of all, you have hudur al-qalb, which is translated as presence of heart. Secondly, you have understanding, tafahum. Thirdly, you have exaltation, ta'zim. 
And then aw, heba, hope, raja, and then haya, translated here as shame. And it could also equally be translated as modesty. And so these six inner states of prayer are what we want to be there throughout the prayer. And so it's not that all six of these are in every single moment of the prayer. We are going back and forth between each of these states. And so he begins with Hudud al qalb And he says, what does it mean to have presence of heart? And he says, in يُفْرِغَ الْقَلْبَ أَنْ غَيْرِ مَا هُمْ مُلَابِسٌ لَهُ وَمُتَكَلِّمٌ بِهِ Is that you free up the heart from anything other than the position that it's in in the prayer and what it is that someone is saying. So the essence of presence of heart is that you are aware of what you are doing and what you are saying at every station in the prayer. So in other words, is that the bodily movements of prayer, there's deep secrets in all of them. The prayer itself is combining the worship of the malaika, of the angels. And there are angels who are just standing before Allah. There are angels that are just bowing before Allah. There are angels that are just prostrating before Allah. And all of the different ways that the angels are glorifying Allah. And all of the different supp supplications and invocations that we're saying in the prayer represent essentially the worship of the angels collectively. What a blessing. And so that to understand that in each position there are special etiquettes that we have. There's a wisdom why we don't recite the Qur'an in the bowing position or in sujood. Qur'an is for the standing position. That in the bowing position, there's a particular invocation that is befitting for that. And likewise in prostration. So being aware of the etiquettes of standing, that we're standing before Allah. Being aware when we're bowing. Being aware when we're in prostration. When we go back into the sitting position, which is known as either the iftirash or the tawarruk position, uh, there's difference of opinion about whether you put the left part of your rear on the ground or on the back part of your, the inner part of your left foot, is that regardless, it's a position of respect. And we're putting our right foot like this with our toes. This is a position of utmost respect. And this is not a position that people normally sit in. If we sit, we're sitting cross-legged, or we might sit like on our two legs, but we don't put up our right foot like that. Uh, so this is a position of adab and respect. And when we honor those positions, and we're aware of them, deeply in our hearts, the prayer starts to change and come to life. And then when we combine to that, what it is that we are saying. We all have to learn what it is, what we're saying in our prayers even if we've just converted fairly recently, even if we don't know very much Arabic. We have to learn through translation, and we have to learn those meanings so at the various stages in our prayer, we can be aware of both what we're doing in the moment as well as what it is that we are saying. And so the essence of presence of heart is that we're focusing on those two dimensions at the same time at every position in our prayer. And we don't allow our fikr, our thoughts, to stray, to think about other things. So this is the first. The second is what is called tathahum. This is simply translated as understanding, although this form in the Arabic language, the form of tafa'ul, indicates is that one strives to understand what it is that they are saying. Okay. And given that our mind does stray, it's very easy for our thoughts to start roaming. So tafahum is the process of forcing yourself, challenging yourself, struggling with yourself to have fahm, to have understanding of what it is that you are doing in the moment. And Imam Ghazali says is that this is clearly a separate meaning to presence of heart, because someone's heart could be present, but they might not actually be reflecting deeply upon what it is that they are saying. And he says, is that the maqam nasfi. People have various degrees when it comes to this. 
and that understanding the meanings of what are being recited. You could have two people saying the exact same thing, but their understandings that are very different. Someone understands it in a very basic way, others in a much more in-depth way. So if someone's saying SubhanAllah, and at a very basic level, they understand that you're glorifying Allah. But someone is saying that with a higher degree of certitude, with a higher degree of knowledge of Allah. Both are saying SubhanAllah, but one, qualitatively speaking, is much heavier in the scales because of the degree of their certitude and what it is that they witness as a believer. And so we start with the basic levels, understand that when we say SubhanAllah, when we say the various invocations associated with the prayer, is that we learn the meanings behind them. And Imam Ghazali says here, وَكَمْ مِنْ مَعَانًا لَطِيفَةً يَفْهَمُهُ الْمُصَلِّ فِي أَثْنَاءِ صَلَاتِهِ وَلَمْ يُكُنْ قَدْ خَطَرَ بِقَلْبِ ذَلِكَ قَبْلَهِ Is it how many people in prayer, and this is of course especially for people that are attempting to concentrate in their prayers, understand very subtle meanings that come to them in their prayers that they had never actually thought about before. And so because this is the greatest thing that one can do, the very best of things you can possibly do is to pray in its time, and especially in the preferred times, in the preferred manner, if possible, in a masjid, in congregation, and so forth. This is the very best of a'mal. And this is something throughout history, and this is, we, some, we have to understand all of this. The greatest scholars that have ever walked the face of this earth that made the contributions that we are still benefiting from to this day. And you could just start listing their names from the earliest period until now. You could say very comfortably that almost all of them were praying all of their five daily prayers in congregation at the beginning of the time for their whole life. That was a given. And so still to this day, you go into the Muslim world. The true ulama do not delay their prayers. They don't. This is the way they are. The prayer is the single most important thing in their life. And it's essential for their academic and scholarly pursuits. And it's very easy to think that when you that start reading, that when you are studying, when you, that, okay, I'm just going to postpone the prayer a little bit. This wasn't the understanding of the people before us who made the greatest scholarly contributions in human history, is that prayer was pivotal in their lives. Everything revolved around that. And so they were all, and of course, they were in societies that facilitated this. There were plenty of masajid and mosques for them to attend that were that close to them and so forth. It was something that you do. You stop, right, and then you go. And Imam Sha'arani actually specifically mentions this. He says that if you're reading a book and the adhan goes off, and you think that you're going to attain more by continuing to read as opposed to respond to the adhan, he says that you haven't understood adab before Allah. Nothing is more important than the moment that you're in. In learning that, and this is unfortunately why, that if we neglect these etiquettes, knowledge can become a veil. And this is one of the very dangerous things of all, when knowledge becomes a veil. And this is the case with religious knowledge, so what about then? secular or worldly knowledge, even more so. So we want to make this a priority. And again, we have challenges in our time, but with a little bit of thought and a little bit of commitment, you'd be surprised the very small changes that you can make that will dramatically that change our relationship to the prayer. So he's saying that prayer is this time that we spend where if we're going to receive inspiration from Allah, this is one of the most likely times for us to receive it. And he says, We heard Ustad Amjad quote the verse in the Quran, in Surah Al-Ankabut, after Allah Ta'ala commands us to establish the prayer. Establish the prayer. That indeed that prayer deters it prevents fahsha, which is all forms of indecency, and munkar, which is wrong action. Wala dhikrullahi 
akbar. And the remembrance of Allah is even greater. Indicating too is that yes, you have the prayer, but then it's the remembrance of Allah that we have inside the prayer and outside of the prayer. Wallahu ya'lamu ma tasna'u. And Allah knows everything that it is that you do. And so there's something about prayer is that by spending time devoting yourself to Allah in those few moments, you develop a resistance that carries over outside of the prayer that helps you live the religious life. Just like in Ramadan, when you devote yourself to Allah in that special month, is that there's a blessing that carries over after the month of Ramadan that gets you through the whole year. And were you not to fast the month of Ramadan, and of course, if someone has an excuse, the fadl of Allah is wasa, his bounty is immense and great, were you to have fasted if you could have. But the month of Ramadan is extremely mubarak. Even if you're not fasting, there are so many different things that you can draw near to Allah Ta'ala through in that blessed month. That month gets you through the year. And you don't always feel it because it's not something that we perceive. It's so incredibly subtle. But were someone not to have fasted, yani out of choice, you would have seen the difference in your life. So Allah Ta'ala has given us these opportunities. And just as, for instance, that if you remember Allah Ta'ala a little bit in the morning and a little bit in the evening, yakfika ma bainuhuma, He will suffice you for the times that are between them. And we heard the hadith in the previous session about praying Fajr in congregation and Isha in congregation. As if you've prayed half or then if you do both the entire night. And then another narration is that Asbaha fi dhimmatillah Bata fi dhimmatillah You are under the protection of Allah. To the extent that Hajjaj, even though that he murdered a lot of people, is that he would ask before that he took someone's life, did he pray in congregation? And even though he was doing something wrong, he didn't want to harm someone. You think that it would make more sense than that, but this is his, but they mentioned, he would ask if they had prayed Fajr in congregation. Because he didn't want to touch someone who was under the protection of Allah. SubhanAllah. And that's like the story of the brigand who was robbing a caravan. And I think it was Sayyidina Ibrahim and Adhim, if I'm not mistaken, one of the Salihin uh, that someone took some, and there was some juice that in someone's saddle, and they mentioned it to the head brigand. That uh, you, he asked him, he says, do you want some juice? He says, I'm fasting. And so this righteous man looks at him like, you're robbing a caravan, like you're fasting? And he said that I wanted to leave a door between me and Allah Ta'ala open. I wanted to leave at least one door between Allah and I open. He's robbing a caravan, but he's fasting. And the meaning here is really deep though, because there's a lot of people that are just caught up in certain things. They just find difficulty in leaving certain things. And sometimes we as a community will not encourage them to do the good that they do, they can still do, right? And so, Years later, this pious man is in front of the Kaaba al-Musharrafa. And then he looks over and he sees the brigand making tawaf. He says, is that you? And he said that, I left the door open between Allah and he accepted me. And he let me in. And this is why I never make anyone despair. And if someone's doing 99 one things wrong, just encourage them to do one thing right. Just encourage them to do the smallest little thing, the tiniest little thing. And you never know, especially in our time, given how difficult things are, is that that could be the door for them to turn to Allah wa ta'ala. So we have hudur al-qalb, which is presence of heart. You're focusing on what you're saying and what you're doing throughout your prayer. Then you have tafahum, which specifically is not only do you have presence of heart, but you are striving to understand the meaning about what it is that you are saying. And then the third inner state is what is called ta'zim. This is a very important word. 
I usually like to try to translate as exaltation. It can also be translated as magnification. There are different ways that you could translate this word, but I like exaltation. And this is a meaning that is beyond both presence of heart and understanding. He said, because you could speak to someone, Imam Ghazali always gives us metaphors to understand things. He says, you could speak to someone, but you might not have ta'zeem in your heart for the person that you're speaking to. You're not be, you might not be honoring them or exalting them. And it's important to say here is that one of the most fundamental principles of the religion is to do what is called in ta'adham ma'adham Allah. Is that we exalt what Allah has exalted. So we have to differentiate here between ta'adham and ibadah. There's a difference. When it comes to Allah, we exalt Him and we worship Him. When it comes to His creation, we exalt what He has told us to exalt, but we don't worship it. So we exalt the Kaaba, we don't worship it. We exalt the Masjid, but we don't worship it. We exalt Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, but of course, we don't worship Him. So there's a difference between worship, which is in addition to exaltation that you are that worshiping the one worshipped. But exaltation is that state of heart that relates to respect, that relates to honoring. And the meanings of exaltation is that there are certain things that you don't do because the sanctity of what it is that you're exalting. There's certain things you don't do in front of the Kaaba. There's certain things that you don't do to your parents. There's certain things you don't say to your parents. There's certain things you don't do. A masjid is not a place for dunya we talk. A masjid is not a place for buying and selling. Uh, a masjid is not a place for that political discourse. That the masjid is the place that connects you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, that in sermons and in classes, if you want that to have clarity on certain matters, that yes, that part of knowledge is to clarify. But a masjid is a place to connect you to Allah primarily. And there are certain things that shouldn't be done in the masjid. They have to be done outside the masjid. And so forth and so on. So ta'deem is beyond presence of heart and understanding. It's where even though we are doing something in the position before Allah, and we are saying various things, we're in a state of munaja, of intimate conversation, there's also ta'deem. Is that we are exalting Allah wa ta'ala. And... When we're in the bowing position, of course, we're saying, Subhan Rabbi al -Azim. That glory be to my Lord, the Alim, the Great. And think about every time that we say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, is that Ta'zim? Who are we standing before? We remember that story that Osad Amjad told us about Sayyidina Ali Zain al Abidin, the great grandson of our Prophet. He was preparing himself to stand before Allah. And the more we prepare while we're making wudu, the more that we'll be prepared when we say that initial takbir. We want to start preparing from the time of wudu. Is that we are now washing ourselves and putting water on our body to cleanse ourselves and to purify ourselves outwardly and then more importantly inwardly to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ultimately, it is only the purified who will be given access to the Qur'an. لا يمسه إلا المطهرون Is that outwardly you have to be in a state of wudu to hold the mushaf. But in order to access its meanings, you have to have a pure heart. And this is what, pure, this is what purification does. And our Prophet told us about wudu, is that when you perform wudu, is that your sins leave your body حَتَّى تَخْرُجَ مِنْ أَضْفَارِهِ Until that they come out of your fingernails. And there are some of the pious, and they actually mentioned this, Imam al-Sha'arani mentions this about Imam Abu Hanifa, is that he used to have the ability to look at water that people made wudu from, and he could see the traces of sin in the water, because it washes it off, khalas. And that's a, you don't want to see people's sins. And think about how hard it is to maintain a good opinion of someone if you see them do some form of abomination. And so imagine that being aware of that, for others, they could smell the stench, the filthy stench of sin. Because we know through prophetic narration is that, uh, that someone will say a kadab, a lie, and that the angels will 
that move away from that person that a mile or some large distance because of the foulness of the stench of that particular that sin that was committed, something, some lie that they said. So this is the nature of disobedience, is that it stinks. There's a huge stench to it. Now, we always don't smell it, but as we become more spiritually aware and in tune, is that this is something that some people are afflicted with. So, ta'zim is to exalt. So, we have presence of heart. We have a focusing on, the underst on understanding what it is that we're saying. And as we're saying it, we have ta'lim. And then there's an additional meaning that is even beyond that. And this is what he calls heiba. Heiba, we've translated here as awe, but really Imam Ghazali speaks of it here as uh, closer to fear. So really what it is, is it is a khawf man sha'ahu ta'lim. It is a type of fear that comes from our exaltation of uh, whatever it is that we are exalting. And so naturally, uh, if we are, if something is truly great, there's a fear that someone might have. There's a fear that someone might have. And that fear is related to having bad adab, bad etiquette, in relation to the greatness of the sanctity of what it is that we are exalting. So that in a sense that having ta'zim for a masjid and exalting it, a masjid is a masjid, even if this was previously a business park in some office space, is that now that it has become a waqf and ultimately then it belongs to Allah. It doesn't belong to anyone in the community. You have a board of trustees and executive committee who are running it. But anything that has become a waqf belongs to Allah. And it has a special nisbah and a special affiliation as a result once it is turned into a masjid. So it requires ta'zim. And then as a result, there has to be khawf, there has to be a bit of fear. Because if someone falls short in their adab and their etiquette in relation to that which must be exalted, they could get themselves in trouble. And that it could that prevent them from drawing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So hayba is a type of awe that comes from fear. And, or you could call it reverential fear, if you want. And that just as you would, and he uses regularly the example of uh, a king, but he, he juxtaposes, for instance, the type of fear that we would have from like an akrab, he mentions a scorpion, right? We fear scorpions because of the pain that it might inflict, that if it stings us. But we're not in awe of the scorpion. We fear the scorpion. But he mentions the example of the Sultan, a very powerful king. You are in awe of them, but you also fear because you know that they could that do something to you. So this awe is beyond ta'zim, it's beyond exaltation. And then we have two other meanings. Presence of heart, understanding, exaltation, awe. Then we have hope, rajab. And this is clearly something else. And so he again goes back to the example of the king, is that you have these people, and again, we don't, in our context, it's very different. The only way we really know, we still kind of understand these metaphors because we see movies. And we see examples of people actually, you know, in movies going into the presence of a king and so forth. So we understand the concept and the purpose here is a, that, uh, a, a pedagogical tool to help us understand the meaning. And that you might fear that a king, uh, but at the same time, you might or might not have hope that they're going to actually do something good for you or at least not harm you. When it comes to Allah wa ta'ala, we have ta'zim for him. We have haiba of him, but we also have hope. And just think about the beauty of this meaning is that everything else that we fear, we run away from. But our fear of Allah causes us to run towards Him in no anthropomorphic way. Everything else you fear, you want to avoid. But Allah, there's no escape. لا ملجا ولا ملجا. There is no refuge and there is no safety from you except to you. 
subhanallah, that we seek refuge in his rida, from his sakhat, in his contentment, from his displeasure, and in his mu'afa, from his uquba, and from the, in his granting us well-being, from him punishing us, wa'udhu bika minka. We seek refuge in you, from you, subhanallah. And so Allah, we turn to him, subhanallah. And there's no greater manifestation of that meaning than on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah when everybody will be standing before Allah. And this is the day of justice. This is the day where all wrongs are righted. And the only one that can speak is Rasulullah. No one else can speak on that day except Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then because of the way he addresses Allah and how it is that he yastarham, he knows how to speak so that Allah Ta'ala's mercy will then unfold. And he says these beautiful, incredible ways of Muhammad, of praising Allah. And then that he's told, خلاص, ishfa to shafa, intercede and you'll be granted intercession. These are the type of qulub that you and I need. These are the type of hearts that we need. Especially in a time where look at how much fasad, how much that wrong there is in the world and what people are doing. Look at the state of the world. And look at the oppression that's happening in the world. And look at what's happening to so many of our Muslim countries. And just, you could start listing, unfortunately, country after country. We need hearts that yastamte rahmatullah. That know how to be, that are means for the mercy of Allah to descend, to come down. These are the type of hearts that we need. And these are the type of hearts that have these meanings. The hearts are, of course, present. They understand what it is that they're reciting, but they have taught them for Allah wa Ta'ala. They have haiba of Allah Ta'ala. But despite all of that, they have hope. They have hope. Because Allah wants His servant to have hope. And He wants His servant to have hope in Him. And our hope is in Allah. Our hope is in Allah. Not in our own abilities, in our own power or anything. Our hope is in Allah. And if he manifests that any of his names that of beauty is that that situation that outwardly we think that we've almost given up on or that are on the verge of despair will completely change instantaneously. <laughs> he does whatever he wants to do. He raises and he lowers. He's the nafa and the dar. He is the one who benefits and he's the one who harms. And everything is totally 100% in his control. Even if people of dunya think that they're in charge and think that they can manipulate the world through technology, Allah is in charge. They're not in charge. And he might let them do a little bit, but in the end, he's in charge. And just look at all the stories of the prophets. In the end, all of them were granted victory by Allah. Even that it seemed like it was grim and it seemed like the other side was going to win. In the end, the prophets always win because Allah grants them victory. And in the end, this is the state of the ummah of our Prophet ﷺ. Despite now the state of Muslims and even the wealthiest Muslim countries, that like in the Khalid, for instance, combined they don't have a GDP like a smaller country in Europe. Just look at the state of poverty in Muslim countries all throughout the world. And what seems to be our powerlessness be in front of these technologically advanced countries with very powerful militaries that seemingly can do whatever it is that they want to do with us. In the end, this is Allah's affair. And all of this could shift in any given moment. The most important thing is that you and I learn how to be. We need hearts that know how to be means for to bring about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy to his creation. This is how you and I need to be. And part of this relates to hope, having hope in Allah wa ta'ala. And then the last meaning that he speaks about is haya. And translated here as 
shame. And of course, shame is one of these words that we have to be very careful with. There are certain meanings that is used in a modern psychological context that we don't connect to a religious meaning. But here, this idea of being embarrassed before Allah because of what you've done. And that's the meaning here of shame. Is that where we've done things, where we realize we shouldn't have done them. Forget about the cultural context and being shamed in a cultural context. That's not what we're talking about here. Just put all that aside. This is shame before Allah. Where you've done something shameful. You've done something reprehensible. You've done something blameworthy before Allah Taala. You've fallen short. And that is a very powerful meaning that we all have to have. And it relates very closely to another meaning of the heart, which is called inkisar, brokenness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when we combine these six meanings in prayer, this is what's going to give life to the prayer. These meanings are the ruh as salah. This is the spirit of the prayer. This is the life of the prayer. This is to the degree that we have these meanings will be to the degree which our prayer weighs heavily in the scales. The more we have the presence of these meanings in our prayer, the heavier that single prayer will be in the scales. And again, you could have two people do all of the same things, and same things outwardly, but to the degree that one person or the other does or does not connect to these meanings will be to the degree which their prayer is accepted and heavy in the scales. So then what Imam Ghazali does he talks about them in a little bit more detail about how it is that we can acquire these meanings. And this is really, really important. So he starts, of course, with Hudud al-Qalb, the inner state of presence of heart. And Imam al-Ghazali is very precise. He says, In the Hudud al-Qalb, sababahu al -himma. The cause that will lead us to have presence of heart and prayer is our Himma. What is our aspiration? And here you could even almost translate that as what is the direction of our heart? What it is, what is really important to us, even? All of that's included in this meaning here of him, which is essentially translated as our spiritual aspiration. Because he says, Your heart will follow what it deems to be important. Your heart will follow what it gives preference to, what it is focused on. It's only going to be present with what you deem to be important. If something is important to you, your heart's going to be present whether you want to or not. So if you have someone sick and they're in the hospital and the doctor's coming out to you to give you the diagnosis, of what's the state of the person that's important to you. Are you going to be thinking about anything else? Are you going to be worried about what you're wearing? Are you going to be worried about the air conditioning? Are you going to be worried about you might not have slept in two days? You will be present with what the doctor says because that's important to you. Right? If your boss sends you an email about something needs to be done, ASAP. Are you going to be thinking of, no, you're going to be preoccupied with that because that's what is important to you. So in other words, whatever is important to us, this is what will dictate whether we are focusing on something or not. It has to be important to us. And he says here, وَالْقَلْبْ إِذَا لَمْ يَحْضَرَ فِي الصَّرَاءَ لَمْ يُكُمْ مَطَعْطِلًا Is that don't think that if you're heart is not present with the meanings of the prayer, is that your heart is just going to remain idle. No. It's going to just roam in relation to everything that it thinks is important from the affairs of this world. So it's not like just you're just not present. No, you're preoccupied with whatever is important to you. Remember we said, prayer is life. This is one of the greatest meanings. Prayer is life. How it is that we live manifests in your prayer. How it is that we live manifests 
in your prayer. And so he says that there is no way ultimately, there is no cure or remedy to make yourself present in prayer except to direct your aspiration towards prayer. Which is obvious. Prayer has to be your himma. So just look at the opposite where you're just delaying your prayer and you don't think it's important. You're not praying any of the sunnahs. You're praying by yourself. You're not, you know, even making sure to fulfill all of the adab and just praying very quickly and getting back to whatever it is that you're doing. Like how on earth do you ever expect to be present in your prayer? Now, if you're obviously traveling in this type of thing, the flight to catch in a rare circumstance, khalas, that's a separate situation. But that can't become the norm. Prayer has to be at the number one degree of importance. So when we hear that fajr clock go off or we have it on our phones or whatever else, how are we as people? Oh, I have plenty of time. I can pray later. Oh, it's daylight savings now. Oh, so I get lower in, you know, at four. I still got a whole hour until Asr. I'm good. Right? No, no. We should be like, I'm not going to relax and feel comfortable until I pray. Prayer time's in, alas. This has to be the very first thing that I do. And especially young people, if you get used to that from now, there's no greater gift you can keep with you your entire life than that. Adhere to the prayer. And I guarantee you, if you make the prayer a priority, Allah will facilitate you in a wondrous way, ways for you to pray. Guaranteed. This is not my guarantee, but this is that something that is mujarrab and tested. If you live for Allah, Allah will facilitate everything for you. And so, there's no other solution other than to direct your himma, your aspiration towards prayer. But then he says, وَالْهِمَّةُ لَا تَنْصَرِفُ وَلَيْهَا مَا لَمْ يَتَّبَيْنْ أَنَّ الْغَرَرَ مَطْرُوبْ مَنْوْتٌ بِهَا is that you're never going to be able to direct your aspiration towards prayer unless that you are convinced that this is something that you actually need, that this is that in your own benefit. And that requires that we have iman, belief, is that the hereafter is better and more everlasting and everlasting. And that the prayer is the greatest means to attain that. And if you combine to that a knowledge of the lowliness of this world, then you will then be able to have presence of heart in your prayer. And he then goes on to say, is that if that doesn't make our heart present, is that we should know is that we have weak iman. So that, in other words, if we go through what he's saying here, is that we recognize the most important thing of all is the hereafter. And we believe in the hereafter. A belief so strong that we're motivated to prepare. And we recognize that the most important thing of all after testifying La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah is our prayer. And that's what we need for the hereafter. We all know that ilman, knowledge wise, but is that our state? And this is sometimes the disconnect. It's between what it is that we know and our state. And this is precisely why Imam al Ghazali wrote the Hilum al Deen was to close the gap between that disconnect between the mind, things that we know, and our inability to put it into practice and become our reality. This is what essentially within Tariqat Akhirah he's trying to remedy. And there is no more important place to do this than in prayer. It all gets back to this. And so, if going through that thought exercise doesn't help us, that means that we have weak iman. And it doesn't mean that we panic and throw in the towel. No, he says, <laughs> We have to then work, our duty then is, to work to strengthen our iman. 
He said, this is not the place for us to go into great detail about how to do that. He does that in different places in the Ihya, and there's ways, of course, to do that. But now we know the root cause that must be worked on. So he says here then, the next step here, after we've remedied this first in relation to our himma, our aspiration, what it is that we deem to be important, then the tafahum. How do we make ourselves that be present, but then also understand what it is that we are reciting? And he doesn't mention uh, the most outward and apparent aspect of this, which is to familiarize ourselves with what we recite in prayer and to learn the Arabic of it, to learn the translation of it, and to memorize it. All of that, I think he's assuming that people uh, have done or are actively doing. Uh, so that's a step that we have to take. Familiarize yourself with what you say in prayer. Learn the meanings of it in whatever language. And of course, you're saying in Arabic, but then you bring to heart the meaning of it, even if it's in a different language. And he says, is that the remedy for understanding is similar to the remedy for making our hearts present. But you add to that to focus what it is that you are reciting on and trying to understand it by the def al shawatar al shaghila is that you repel your inner speech that is trying to preoccupy you. The khawatar literally are thoughts. And you have to be careful. So you'll be in prayer and you'll be concentrating. Then all of a sudden, you'll think about something else. And then if you're not careful, it just takes you and it takes you and it takes you and it takes you and it takes you. Right? You're in prayer and all of a sudden you'll be like, I can't believe he said that. I can't believe she did that. Right? You're reciting, but then all of a sudden, and then it arouses an emotion. Right? Where you get like angry, or you get bothered, right? And you're in prayer. And the next thing you know, right? Or in the realm of sensory, is that we have to be careful about what we let into our senses. And there's a difference between just driving by and looking at a billboard and quickly looking down, as opposed to fixating our eyes on it. When you fixate your eyes on something from the sensory, it's much more likely to, you're much more likely to think about it. And so you might be in prayer and then you just can't get that image out. I mean, all of us have prayed after watching a sports game or watching a movie or something like that. You're thinking about scenes in that movie. Uh, you're thinking about scenes in a movie in your prayer. We all know that, right? You know, if you try to pray at halftime for the NBA finals or the semifinals, right? You're thinking about what it is that you just saw. It's almost impossible not to. Even if you're focused, it comes to your thoughts. So we have to be very careful with these types of things. And so what you have to do is, is that you have to deflect your inner speech. You have to protect yourself from what it is that you allow in. And most importantly, what it is that you see and what it is that you hear. Allah has given you eyes and he's given you eyelids. And you can look at something, boom. Immediately you lower your gaze. Yeah, that's how we should be. To all haram, anything that is disliking, dislike to Allah. You lower your gaze completely from it. And, and that actually might be physically lowering your gaze, or sometimes it means uh, whatever you have to do to turn away from it, sometimes it's just closing your eyes. But remember what Rasul Amjad said, is that those thoughts that come to your heart, is that the quickness that we traverse on the surat, on the sirat, the traverse, is to the degree which we turn away from things that are displeasing to Allah. And then when our nafs is in a lower stage, your nafs might want to look at that thing. It might want to engage in that thing. But your mind like, no, I know it's bad for me, but your nafs is pulling you in that direction. And in that moment, there's nothing else you can do other than just to be strong, reliant upon Allah, and turn away. And then the more you do that, the easier it gets. That is the essence of deen. Right there, is, that's the essence of religiosity. Is in those moments where you're being pulled in a direction, just for Allah only to be strong and to resist. And sometimes it's hard. 
And sometimes you, it's like swallowing bitter medicine that you don't want to take. But there's nothing greater with Allah than that. And if you do that time and time again, it gets easier and it gets easier and it gets easier. And then you might slip. And then a tribulation comes your way to remind you, La ilaha illallah. And then you get back on course. Okay. Allah is merciful, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so then he says here, is that, وَإِلَاجْ دَفْعِ الْخَوَاتَرِ الشَّاغِرَ The way that we uh, remedy the thoughts that we have, which is really, you could also say your inner speech, although your thoughts include what your inner speech doesn't include, because your inner speech is really the thoughts of the ego, your egotistical thoughts from the nuts. Uh, but the other, the other khawatir include also the demonic insinuations. Is that qat'u mawadiha? In other words, is that you uproot the sources of those various thoughts. And what he says here, what I mean by that is, is that looking at all of the means that once you uproot your connection to those things, is that the sources of those thoughts are now gone so that they are significantly less. And that gets down to the uh, meanings that we mentioned to you outwardly about being careful what we let in from the realm of the sensory. But then he says at a deeper level as well, is that our traits of the, the inner states that we have. So he mentions here specifically, mahabba. What do we love? فَمَنْ أَحَبَّ شَيْئًا أَكْثَرَ ذِكْرَةً If you love something, you will mention it often. That's all there is to it. If you love something, you will mention it often. If you love California, you'll talk about California all the time. If you love spring, you'll talk about spring all the time. If you love a particular plant, that you'll probably get it in your home and talk about it and have it in your backyard all the time. You will speak often about what it is that you love. So in addition to the outward dimension, you also, we also have to be careful about what it is that we let our heart, our hearts love. And that's not always so easy. That's a little bit amb ambiguous, the way that our aspiration is ambiguous. We have to work on that. And to make sure that our heart loves what should be loved. But this is getting down. This is why, again, prayer is life. This is uncovering for us, and what a blessing. This is uncovering for us these things that are so fundamental to the human experience, of things that we absolutely need. So then, ta'deem. And he says that this is a state of heart that comes from two different types of knowledge. The first is the knowledge of the majesty of Allah and His greatness. So we have to learn about the majesty of Allah. We have to look at the explanation of the name of Allah, al alim the name of Allah, Al-Majid, all of these great names of Allah. And alhamdulillah, we even have translations of the Asma Allah al-Husna, that we can learn about these great names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the great, the glorious, the jalali wa ikram, the possessor of majesty and generosity. And this is from the foundations of our faith. And that we think about one of the great ways to do this, and Imam Ghazali mentions this as a way to make your heart present in prayer. You think about everything that Allah created. And modern science actually helps us in that. I mean, you didn't need to be a scientist to reflect upon these matters ever, because it's enough just to think about what it is that you see. But now think about what it is that we know, not experientially, but some of it are through images, through the microscope, or through the telescope, and some is it through mathematical equations, because math is the language of science, so we understand the vastness of Allah's creation and the 200 billion galaxies that are in our known universe, and the incredible intergalactic distances that are out there, and just sh the sheer distance from planet Earth to the sun, and how big Earth is, and that we are uh, rotating on our axis and orbiting the sun, both of which is happening, moving extremely fast, but because Earth is so large, we don't feel it. We don't feel like we're even moving. This is amazing. And you start to think about all of these things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is creating that and recreating it in every single moment. He's fully in charge of everything. That is amazing. That should strengthen your faith. And 
that should cause you to have ta'zim for Allah. The creator of the heavens and earth is the one you're standing before in that moment. And nothing centers you and nothing orients you more than praying to the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Outwardly, we orient ourselves towards the Kaaba. Tamam? But inwardly, your orientation is towards Allah. Wajjahdu. And in the Shafi school, we do the dua al istiftah. The opening supplication is after saying, Allahu Akbar Kabira, Alhamdulillah Kathira. Then we go on to say, Wajjahdu wajjah lilladhi fatara samawati wirat. I have directed my essence, your wajj is your face, but it's also your internal essence, to the originator of the heavens and the earth. SubhanAllah. That's what we're doing when we stand up to pray. And so you go through these thought exercises to help you to have ta'zeem of Allah. But he says then also that you want to combine with that ma'rifati haqarat nafsi wa khissatiha wa kawniha abdan musakharan marbuban. You learn about the vile nature of, and the lowly nature of creation, but in specifically that the human being. And this is again not to cause someone that uh, we don't want to misunderstand these things. Is that on one hand, is that we have hoped that we can obtain something great. But when we talk about the nafs, that insofar as it started as a drop of fluid, insofar as is that it is totally insignificant. And there was a time where it was never even known that it's something lowly. And we know how we began and we know how it is that we'll end. And so from that perspective is that we don't see anything as being special except insofar as Allah has made it special. So this is our that view of all of creation, everything in creation. And he says then, حَتَّى يَتَّوَلِّدْ مِنَ الْمَعْرِفَتَيْنِ what comes from, then emerges from, these two types of knowledge, i.e. the knowledge of the greatness of Allah and the knowledge of that how His creation is in absolute need of Him and everything is subservient to Him, including that human beings, of course. Is that then we have al-istikana, wal-inkisar, wal-khushur. Is that we are broken before Allah, we are lowly before Allah, we are reverent before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, this is ta'aleem. That state of being is ta'aleem. But again, is that we have to spend time with this and to reflect upon these things so that this becomes our state. Now, so then he goes on to talk about al-hayba wal-khawf, awe and fear. And when someone comes to understand the power of Allah Ta'ala, and what he calls the nafuz of mashiatihi, how he imposes his will as he wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says here, and this is a hard pill to swallow, but it needs to be said. He said that were he to completely destroy all people, those who came before and those who will come at the end of time. It would not diminish his dominion the slightest bit, the weight of an atom. Allah is Allah. And that first movement of the heart where we think that we actually deserve to exist is one of is probably the source of all the problems. We don't deserve to exist. We do not deserve to exist. If we feel entitled to our existence, there is a long list of diseases of the heart that will arise from that feeling of entitlement. That's deep. This is very, very deep. And that when we start, yes, that when we talk about people who don't believe, there's a way of uh, speaking to them rationally. But oftentimes that we have to combine to that as well, spiritual meanings as well, to really help them understand. And usually that there's very few people that just through rational discourse that go from a particular belief to another. Something else must touch them deeper. And we start approaching this conversation. And then essentially 
the essence of kufr and iman, of disbelief and belief, is built upon the willingness or the reluctance of the individual to submit to the Lord of the heavens and the earth and embrace their servitude before him or to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is at the crux and the very heart of the whole matter. And if someone's willing to accept that, but most people have so many layers of veils that are preventing them from accepting that, that you have to chop away, you have to chop away. Where you start to finally get to, mm, this is where it really lies. And you have to deal with that. And in the end, this whole affair is built upon submission. Allah says, Am lil insani ma tamanna. Will the human being have what it is that he wants? This is not our affair. This is an affair ultimately of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to happen. So by coming to understand this, and we see, and he actually mentions here, is he says that, he says then, you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends tribulations and all different types of difficulties to the prophets and the awliya. Even though he's all powerful and he can prevent that all from happening, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the nature of the dunya. And this is, strengthens our iman now. Because Allah is all-powerful. Everything that's happening to the ummah, the unimaginable things that are happening to believers right now, Allah is all-powerful. He can prevent it from happening. But there's a wisdom. There's a wisdom in it happening. In addition to the sharia dimension of disliking what Allah has commanded us to dislike and doing what it is that you can, this is the other side of the same coin that must be there for us to maintain our sanity, but also to respond in a way that is pleasing to Allah. Everything is from Allah. He could repel it if he wanted to, subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a wisdom behind it. And as Imam Hassad says, he has a book of aphorisms, and the very first aphorism is, is that all of creation is either in the da'irat al-Rahmah or the da'irat al-Hikmah in this world. They're either in the circle of wisdom or in the circle, in the circle of mercy or in the circle of wisdom. And then he said, those who are in the circle of mercy in this world will receive the fadl of Allah, his bounty in the next world. Those who are in the circle of wisdom in this world will receive his adal, his justice in the next world. So this reflecting upon these realities that helps us attain the state of haybah. And then raja. Is that we come to understand the lutf of Allah, His benevolence, that His subtle generosity, that subhanahu wa ta'ala, His gentleness, and in His karam, His generosity, and His amim and ami, His that wide reaching, that giving of blessings and all of the subtleties of everything that is that he's created. And knowing the promise that he's given for the people uh, that, who, that do what they've been commanded to do, to attain paradise and so forth. And so that when we attain yaqeen, certainty, in relation to his promise, and the knowledge that we have of his lutf, is that then we'll have to have hope in Allah. We have to have hope in Allah. And so again, we're combining between these different meanings. But when we that think, when we hear about His mercy, when we see in His creation that all of these manifestations of His benevolence, and if you want a practical way to help you understand that, I would encourage you to be very practical here. Uh, get Imam Ghazali's translation. Uh, get the translation of Ramazai's book, Al Maqsad al Asna, the highest aim. And read the description of the name of Allah, Al Latif. And then read Surah Yusuf and try to understand it as a manifestation of the name of Allah, Al Latif. 
And then look how Allah says towards the end of Surah Allah, Latifun Lima Yasha'u. And connect the meaning of Surah Yusuf to the name of Allah Latif. And this will help you understand this particular meaning. And then the final one is Al Haya. And the way we do this is going through this thought exercise of realizing how we fall short in worship and how we're unable to fully that's uphold the haq, the right that Allah Taala has upon ourselves. And we combine with that a knowledge of our faults and that all the things that we've done wrong and how we're inclined into the things of this world is that when we reflect upon those things, necessarily, is that we will have a state of shame come before Allah, that we will be the embarrassed before Allah. And of course, that have modesty before Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then he says, فَحَادِي أَسْبَابْ حَادِي سِفَاتِ These are the ways to attain these various inner states of prayer. And he says, وَكُلُّ مَا طَرِبَ تَحْسِرُوا فَعِلَاجُوا إِحْبَارُوا سَبَبِهِ Is that if you want to attain any of these states, you have to go about the causes that will then lead to them and that the various thought exercises that he mentioned and he says that the remedy is known through knowing the cause what links all these means is iman faith and yaqeen certitude in other words, is that the more that we strengthen our Iman, the more certitude that we have, the easier that it will be for us to attain all of these meanings, because again, prayer is life. And he quotes this beautiful narration that say to Aisha that she said, Kana Rasulullah The Prophet would speak to us and we would speak to him. And the Prophet was very close to people. He was like anyone else in the house when he was at home, even though he's not like anyone else, not only in the house and the entire cosmos. But this is how he was. He was approachable. He was very easy. He would sweep the floor, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would cut meat. He would milk his sheep. He would bend and tend to his affairs, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would help around the house that he would mend his own sandals and so forth. He was very approachable. Anyone could that speak to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would speak to them. And that if they would speak about worldly affairs, he would speak about worldly affairs. He would remind them at the same time about the hereafter. And they used to say, Kan From time to time, he would admonish us. Right? Because if you just tell someone day in and day out, you tell your kids seven, eight times a day, da, 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 they just eventually, let's go deaf to you, what you're saying. Right? You have to, can he? Know when to say what and to what degree and so forth. But, فَإِذَا حَضَرَةَ الصَّلَاةَ فَكَأَنَّهُ لَمْ يَعْرِفْنَا وَلَمْ نَعْرِفْنَا But once it came time for prayer, it was as if he did not know us and we did not know him. This is the time to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the degree that we reflect these meanings, these six inner states uh, of prayer in the heart will be to the degree that we are giving the prayer that it's haq. And that in closing, there's this beautiful statement, Imam al that includes part of it, but it's originally from Qut al-Qulub. They say, in al abd yuhshur and al mawt min qabri ala hayatihi fi salata. This is sufficient of proof and a motivating factor for us to take prayer seriously. A servant will be raised after death from his grave according to his hay'a, how he was in prayer. To what degree were they present in their prayer? And such that they had stillness and tranquility in their prayer. So imagine, Yawm al Qiyamah, which is subjectively from two light rakats to 50,000 years, people experience it somewhere in that realm. Is that your raha, your repose, your repose on the Day of Judgment will be according to that your repose in prayer. In other words, 
that the more that we have tana'am, that we actually enjoy praying, the more that we find pleasure in praying, the more that we are comfortable praying, the more that we that have presence of heart in our prayer, that will directly translate on Yom Al-Qiyamah to how it is that we experience that day. The more repose we have in prayer, the more repose on Yom Al-Qiyamah. Is that the more that we enjoy our prayers, the less that we'll fear on Yom Al-Qiyamah al It directly relates to how we are in prayer. What are we in a ma'na hala? And Abi Hurair, this is a mawkuf, that meaning that is narrated by one of the Sahaba, by uh, that Abu Hurairah. And Imam Musa says, وَلَقَدْ صَدَقْ So he's told the truth. And then he quotes the meaning of a hadith. The hadith in Sahih Muslim, يُبْعَثْ كُلُّ عَبْدٍ عَلَى مَا مَاتَ عَلَيْهِ Every servant will be raised according to how it is that they died. Right? Their state of when they died will be how they're raised. And so that if we love prayer and enjoy prayer and start to find the halawa in the sweetness of prayer and find pleasure in the prayer, the way we experience Yom Qiyamah is going to be very different than the way we've experienced it were we to have been deficient in that. So this is why we come together to study these meanings in hopes that we attain something of the reality by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah ta'ala give us tawfiq and to us, us to understand and to give us all of these inner states of the prayer in ways that he gifts the elect of the awliya and the saniheen. May Allah ta'ala have mercy upon all of us, forgive us all our sins and to remove all of the veils and all the obstacles between us and attain degrees of closeness to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammadin wa ala alayhi wa sallam wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I apologize for going over. And we will continue back, as I understand, uh, after Salah at 145, correct? Somewhere. So inshallah, in this session, we're going to look at reverence, khushur, and presence of heart in the Salah. And we're going to look at Imam al-Ghazali's section on uh, the merit of reverence, of having khushur. And uh, it's important to understand a little bit of the context of the Ihya Ulum al -Din and that people did not really, before Imam al-Ghazali, one of the amazing contributions that uh, he gave this ummah is that he was able to really merge people's understandings of the outward and the inward sciences. And as Sheikh Yahya said previously that really this is a science because of the systematic way that he actually uh, details the spiritual path and explains it in a way where he's able to break down you know, various elements and, and sub-points that are all interrelated. So one of the things that's important is that people were focused on the outward validity of the salah. Is that if the salah is valid according to the fuqaha, which is important, then the salah is considered valid. And Imam al-Ghazali is highlighting for us that if the whole purpose of the salah is to draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, as we're going to see, وَأَقِيمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ The first verse that he mentions is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, and establish the prayer for my remembrance, is that the prayer is not actually truly established if it does not contain the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says if someone is in the prayer and they don't know what they're saying and they're not uh, they don't have this reverence, they don't have khushur and presence of heart and the various inner states that uh, Imam al-Ghazali uh, mentions that Shaykh Yahya covered in session two, then really it's just movements and emptiness internally. And that's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. So he's also uh, speaking to certain people who might not consider khushur and presence of heart as a condition for the validity and acceptance of the salah. So he's coming at it from uh, this angle. And I think for our purposes, we already understand the importance of that. So he begins with the verse that I mentioned, وَأَقِيمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ Establish the prayer for my remembrance. It is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the goal of all acts of worship and the goal of all that we do in order to seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to have presence of heart. 
So if we are in salah, you know, we want to have presence of heart because that really is the indication of coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and truly remembering Him. When we avoid what is haram, we do so because we have presence of heart and we have an awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that He sees us and has forbidden us from that thing, so we avoid it. When we engage in charity or we seek knowledge or we attend a gathering of dhikr, the goal in that is to have presence of heart. وَأَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ Establish the prayer for my remembrance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse of the Qur'an, وَلَا تَكُمْ مِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ And do not be of those who are heedless and neglectful. Do not be of those who are heedless and neglectful. So Imam al-Ghazali says, if someone makes an oath that they're going to speak to the king or they're going to engage in a particular uh, uh, verbal statement, I swear that I will say this particular thing. And then while they're asleep, they actually talk in their sleep and they say what they swore that they were going to say. He says they actually haven't fulfilled their oath because they were not conscious of it. So even though they might have said unconsciously what they uh, swore that they would say, because they were not conscious when they did it, it doesn't count. So the same can be said about the salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another verse of the Qur'an, لَا تَقْرَبُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَنْتُمْ سُكَارَ حَتَّى تَعْلَمُوا مَا تَقُولُونَ Do not approach the prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what it is that you are saying. And Imam al-Ghazali, he says, how many a person who's engaging in the salah has not, uh, uh, has not consumed alcohol or is not intoxicated, but does not know what they are saying in the prayer. So he says, okay, that part about while you are drunk or while you are intoxicated does not apply to the generality of believers and people avoiding that act that is haram. But then he says the condition that's associated with it still applies. Until you know you're aware of what it is that you are saying. So Imam al-Ghazali says if a person is praying and they're unaware of what they're saying, and that applies to presence of heart and understanding that Shaykh Yahya covered in the previous session, then, uh, you know, uh, then they, they still fall within this category. Do not approach the prayer in that state. So you have to be aware of that. The Prophet sallallahu he said in a hadith, مَنْ صَلَّى رَكْعَتَيْنِ لَمْ يُحَدِّثْ نَفْسَهُ فِيهِمَا بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الدُّنْيَا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ Whoever prays two rak'ahs and their nafs does not, uh, you know, you are not, uh, you are not listening or giving the opportunity to your nafs to speak to you about things of the world, the reward for having that level of presence in the salah is that Allah forgives your previous sins. So once again, Imam al-Ghazali is saying, this is critical for the prayer to be accepted, to be of those people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they establish a true prayer, they're transformed. And they avoid al-fahsha wal-munkar, indecency and wrongdoing, by being present in the salah, by not giving in to the insinuations and the internal conversations of the nafs that take us into the dunya. And what we're going to look at shortly is how to identify those outward and inward distractions and how to deal with them. We'll get to that inshallah ta'ala. But if a person has that level of presence, their previous sins are forgiven. Naam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he also said in another hadith, إِنَّمَا فُرِضَتِ الصَّلَاةُ وَأُمِرَ بِالْحَجِّ وَالطَّوَافِ وَأَشْعَرَةِ الْمَنَاسِكُ لِإِقَامَةِ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said in a hadith narrated by Abu Dawood and At-Tirmidhi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the prayer an obligation and commanded the hajj and the circumambulation 
and the various rites of worship associated with the Hajj, for what purpose? In order to establish the remembrance of Allah the Exalted. In order to establish the remembrance of Allah the Exalted. So that's an indication once again that the khushur is the life of the prayer. The khushur is the life of the prayer. And Imam al-Ghazali then gives us another, uh, another very useful way of understanding how we get into that mindset. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and we might sometimes hear sometimes the Imam when leading the prayer will say this, pray a farewell prayer. That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he's the one who said, وَإِذَا صَلَّيْتَ فَصَلِّ صَلَاتَ مُوَدِّعِينَ If you pray, then pray the prayer of someone who is bidding farewell. And Imam al-Ghazali says there are many layers of meaning to this farewell. What does it mean to bid farewell? Imam al-Ghazali then says, this is not part of the hadith, that a person is saying farewell to his own nafs. Farewell to your insinuations and your desires and your love of the world. Farewell to the nafs. Farewell to one's passions. They're not thinking about those things in the salah, ideally. And then he says, farewell to one's life. So they say that as if you're bidding farewell, that this is the last prayer that you will pray before you meet your Lord. And if that was the case, that would be a transformative prayer. If someone knew, let's say, for example, may Allah protect us, that there was someone oppressive who said, you know, I'm going to execute you and take your life. You have one last prayer that you can pray. What would be the state of that prayer before you know that you're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It would be full of khushur and full of hope and full of fear and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the most important things and not being distracted by anything. Allah, there is nothing. What am I going to think about the world for when it's done? So the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is telling us that when you have that mindset, that is the way you are supposed to pray. That's how you truly access the khushur in the salah. La ilaha illallah. Now, I'm one of the pious predecessors, and this relates to what Imam al Ghazali said previously. He said, Ibn Adam, O son of Adam, O human being. If you want to enter into the presence of your Lord without permission, without a formal invitation, you know, the kings of the world, special time, special, you have to talk to the right person, you, have to, you might have to pay people some bribes, to, you might owe some favors and all of that type of stuff in order to get to the people of the dunya. If you want to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's saying, if you want to enter his presence without even a formal invitation or permission, you can do so. And he said, how so? He said, you make your wudu and you enter into your mihrab and then you enter into the presence of your Lord without any formal permission. And you get to speak to him without any translator. Like it's that level of nearness and intimacy. You know, someone will at least have a representative or someone who's going to Keep the time, you can only speak for this long. In these formal settings of the people of the dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left the door open whenever you want. In dua, in salah, in turning your heart to Him, the door is always open. Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha, she's telling us here about the state of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how this relates to khushur the complete focus and priority he would give the salah. That she said, and you know, she's the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, so she knows, you know, some of these private details and intimate details that maybe other people might not have been privy to or might not have witnessed. So she says, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, when he was at home, he would speak with us and we would speak with him. That we would have these family conversations and he would listen to them and they would say things about what was interesting to them or their day or what they were going through and the Prophet ﷺ would listen and then he would also talk to them and this is actually a beautiful sunnah that uh, uh, not many people are really aware of is that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, he would speak to the Sahaba about whatever they wanted to talk about 
So, oh, Messenger of Allah, you know, my camel is kind of not feeling well. You know, oh, really, what, how, what's going on? And he would, he would engage and entertain whatever was important to them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his heart is with Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But look at the mercy. You know, and and uh, there are many, many beautiful examples of that. You know, and I'm reminding myself and all of us, especially with, you know, these devices and kind of being, having our attention always, you know, scattered, is that when you're with someone, it's a sunnah to give them your full attention. And even physically, the Messenger of Allah, so I said, when he would turn to someone, he would turn to them with the entirety of his body to give them that full attention. If that is the consideration that he gave to other created beings out of his mercy and his noble character, imagine when it's time to stand in the mihrab. Imagine when it's the time that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yearns for the most. To be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Sayyidina Aisha is saying that he would talk to us and we would talk to him. But when the time for the prayer entered, the adhan goes off, it's time for salah. It's as if he didn't know us and we didn't know him. There was nothing else in the world except responding to the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma salli alayhi wa ala And just imagine that he would say, Arihna biha ya Bilal. You know, give us, bring the, uh, what brings us comfort. Give us what brings us comfort, O oh Bilal. And that was the adhan because it was the uh, initiation or the beginning of entering into the salah. <clears throat> the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La yanduru Allahu ila salatin, la yahduru rajul fiha qalbahu ma'badani. That Allah does not look at a prayer in which a person's heart is not present with their body. And what does that mean? It means that they're present in the salah. When they say that, you know, your heart is present, like, where, where are you? Someone might be here, say, where are you? Because their heart is somewhere else, their mind, their imagination is somewhere else. You have to be here with Allah, that your heart is present with the rest of your body, it's not just the movements in the salah, which is once again an indication of acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Ghazali mentions that Prophet Ibrahim al-Khalil alayhi salam, he said when he would enter, when he would stand up to pray, they could hear the intensity of his heartbeat from two miles away. That his heart would beat with such power and there was a reverberation from his heartbeats that people could hear it from two miles away because of the, 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 the magnitude of standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he saw a man, he saw a man playing with his beard in the salah. He saw a man playing with his beard in the salah and he was praying, just kind of, and the Prophet ﷺ said, لَوْ خَشَعَ قَلْبُ هَذَا If this man's heart had reverence and this awe before Allah, لَخَشَعَتْ جَوَارِحُ His limbs would follow suit and be in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember hearing our teacher, Habib Umar, commenting on people sometimes they have, like if you have like a, a Igal or a Shmah, and he said every couple of seconds a person's fixing what's on their, their headgear and they're moving things around. He said, you know, how can someone do that while standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so you have, to, you have to be careful, even to the extent that they say if you're wearing, for example, like it's a sunnah to wear a rida, to wear like a shawl. For, for the, you know, that when a person is praying, if they feel that it's going to move around and fall around and flap around, that they put it on the ground in front of them so that it doesn't distract them. And so, you know, if a person's heart has khushur, the limbs will follow suit. And it's not something that is kind of this, uh, you know, this uh, synthetic, like this manufactured fake way of having where a person just goes like this and they kind of, you know, overdo it physically. No, but it's, it's a balance. Everything is a balance. And it really is, yes, if your heart is present with Allah, maybe there might be an impact on the way that you uh, stand or the way that you move. But the asl is to begin with the heart and to have just the sunnah balanced way of standing and having moderation in all things. And then if someone 
feels a particular verse, I remember one of the most amazing things I ever experienced. And I was young, I was like 22 at the time, when I first uh, was blessed to go study in, in Hadramaut in Yemen at Dar al-Mustafa, and it was Ramadan. And there were just so many things that happened where it was like, wow, this deen is real. Like, you know, it's, but then there's like things that happen, like, this deen is real. You know, you see it lived at that level. It's different. So I remember it was Salatu Taraweeh, and we're talking about prayer, and this is really, you know, this is just kind of a beautiful example, especially in today's world. There are people like that today. Where I remember it's the first night of Ramadan, if I'm not mistaken, it happened multiple times on multiple nights. But the Imam was was reciting the Quran in Salatu Taraweeh, and it was it was very majestic. The way he recited the first night of Ramadan, it, it felt like you really, we always, we always feel it, alhamdulillah, many people really notice that when Ramadan comes in, there's like this shift in the cosmos. Something has changed. So it was intensified because being in the company of such people. And then there was a man that I heard, uh, you know, somewhere to the left or behind, or wherever he was standing. And as the Quran was being recited and it was intense, he said, Allah, Allah, Allah. And he passed out. You know, and I'm praying and I'm just kind of like, what, what? Like, I can't look back and see who it was. I never, I never saw who it was. And uh, just subhanAllah. And I, just, and I was like, this deen is real. Like you hear about the Sahaba being bedridden for days and, and weeks from the Quran. You know, and, and it's like the Qur'an here is not just some, somebody with a nice voice who recites it and there's inshallah good in that. But it was like, this is the Qur'an that you realize if it was revealed to the mountain, the mountain would, would crumble underneath the, the weightiness of the Qur'an. Like there are people whose hearts, you know, are, are present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once again, you can't fake that level of presence. I was someone of a special state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it goes to show that there are still people experiencing these really uh, powerful realities of the salah. <laughs> MashaAllah. And then Imam al-Ghazali tells us a few stories of people who had such a high level of khushu' in the salah that they were totally uh, unaffected by their surroundings. Right? But that's a very high level. And as Imam al-Ghazali is going to tell us shortly when he talks about the way to have presence of heart, that is a very select few of people who attain that level. Where, for example, uh, Sayyidina Ali Zain al-Abideen was praying and one of the pillars in the masjid uh, broke. And there was a, a large, you know, sound and a crash that happened when it took place. And after he was done with the salah, they asked him, what did you see? You were in the masjid when the pillar broke and, it, and he didn't hear anything. And there was a sahabi who had to have his leg amputated. He said, you know, when you get, it's going to be intense, it's painful. He said, amputate my leg when I'm in the salah. These are the realities that the sahaba had, radiallahu anhum, and they amputated it and he uh, became aware of it after he finished his prayer. Now these stories are not meant to make us feel like, oh, I'm so terrible, I can't even do 1% of that. But it's a, it's, it shows us the potential and the possibility. And when we hear about these great people, it is meant to encourage us and inspire us, not the other way around. Like, oh, I'm never gonna be like that. I, I might as well, you know, pack my bags and just like, I'm useless, I can't do that. No, that's not what we want. Say, inshallah, the one who gave to them can also give to me, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who chose those people to be of the people of nearness to him can choose me, inshallah, to be of those people. Each and every one of us, inshallah ta'ala. And the fact that Allah has brought us together to study on how to pray properly is a sign that Allah has extended his mercy to us. And we ask him for tawfiq, ya rabbil alameen. كان علي بن أبي طالب رضي الله عنه وكرم وجهه إذا حضر وقت الصلاة 
يتزلزل ويتلون وجهه سيدنا علي بن أبي طالب may Allah be well pleased with him and ennoble his countenance when the time for prayer would enter he would start to shake and his face would change color they said ما لك يا أمير المؤمنين so what's going on O commander of the believers and he said the time has come to fulfill the covenant the trust that Allah presented to the heavens and the earth and the mountains and they refused it and were in fear of it and we are the ones who took it on indicating that that amana that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran is the salah so he the level of reverence the level of khushu' and presence of heart of recognizing once again the significance of what we're about to engage in and stand in and then we'll we'll end with this narration it's a really beautiful uh, narration mashallah uh, on the uh, the this is a statement of hatim al-asam one of the great pious predecessors radiyallahu anhu and someone once asked him about his prayer so he said when the time for prayer enters asbaghtu al-wudu i performed the wudu well fully uh, covering all the limbs and doing it with presence of heart and intentionality and recognizing that this is the key into the prayer and i came and i come to the pray the place where i am going to pray and i actually sit there we're going to talk about this shortly i sit there until i am collected then i become collected then i stand to prayer so then i place the kaaba this is a way of using our imagination in a way that is uh, useful and uh, beneficial especially spiritually is to use the faculty of imagination for things like this he says then I place the Kaaba before my very eyes imagining it it's as if I'm standing right in front of the Kaaba and I place the Sirat that goes over hellfire the, tra the traverse that goes over hellfire I place it at my feet it's as if I can see it at my feet. And I imagine paradise to my right. And I imagine the fire to my left. And I imagine the angel of death standing behind me. And I think and ponder deeply that this will be my final prayer. Then I stand and pray and I am between the state of hope and fear. So I begin the prayer and I say, Allahu Akbar. And I recite the Quran with tartil, full uh, recitation, giving each of the letters its right and reciting properly and with reverence. And then when I go into ruku'ah, the bowing position, I do so with humility. And when I go into prostration, I prostrate uh, with uh, reverential fear, with this khushu'ah. And, uh, you know, when I sit in the position, I do so with sincerity. And when I, I try to have sincerity of heart, and when I finish the prayer, I do not know, has it been accepted from me or not? Even after all of that, I still remain in a state between hope and fear. Is it accepted or not? And Sayyidina Abdullah ibn al-Abbas radiallahu anhumah, he said, ركعتاني مقتصدتان في تفكر خير من قيام ليلة والقلب ساه. He says two rak'ahs that you perform with you know well, that you're not rushed and hasty in completing. That uh, but even مقتصدتان is that they're not very long and they're not rushed. Just even two uh, uh, moderate rak'ahs that are not very long that you pray while you are reflecting and pondering what you're reciting and thinking about your state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of the things associated with the prayer is better for you than standing up the entire night in prayer and your heart is heedless. Just two brief, moderate rak'ahs with reflection are better than an entire night where your heart is heedless. 
So we have to have, now the great salihin, they have quality and quantity. But for us, sometimes people think that quantity alone is sufficient. No, but you want quality. We want quality. And when we have, when we focus on that, then when we start to access the real fruits of the salah, then we want more of it. And quantity starts to uh, become very naturally accessible and desirable to us. So now moving on to the section on the distractions and how we have presence of heart in the face of uh, these distractions, the outward and inward distractions. So Imam al-Ghazali, he says, beautifully here, he talks about the inner states of the prayer that Shaykh Yahya covered. That a believer has to be in a state of reverence for Allah the Mighty and Majestic, in fear of Him, hope in, having hope in Him, having this haya, this shame before Him for one's own shortcomings. And that these states, they are never totally separated from the believer according to the degree of his or her certitude and faith. That there are people who are at higher levels uh, and people who might experience it from time to time, but it is never totally separated from a believer. He says, and that's their state outside of the salah. So then it is only taken away from them or it is only absent in the salah due to al-khawatir al-warida al-shaghila. These passing thoughts that come that busy a person. So if a person in the salah is not having these states that very naturally a believer should have and does have, if they are uh, you know, not present as they should be in the salah, it's due to these passing thoughts. So the treatment in order to have presence of heart is actually rejecting and repelling these passing thoughts. وَلَا يُدْفَعُ شَيْءُ إِلَّا بِدَفْعِ سَبَبِهِ And this is where Imam al-Ghazali is very systematic. He says you cannot uh, repel something or deflect that thing or push it away except by finding its root cause. You have to get to the root of it and deal with that in order to truly do so. تَمَام سَبَبَ So you have to come to know the reason behind them. And the reason is that it could be either an outward cause or it could be something within the person internally, inwardly. So then he breaks down both. As for the outward, uh, as for the outward, he says that these are the things that pass through the thoughts and what a person sees. These are the things that a person might hear or see when they're in the middle of the salah. You know, like you're in the middle of the prayer, you know, we all have this and there's like a loud sound or, you know, your kids like start crying or they're hitting each other. It's kind of, what's going on? It takes up your thoughts. The khawatir are now coming. The passing thoughts are now, who hit who? Whose fault was it? You know, and you start to go through that. Uh, those various thoughts that are all interconnected and associated. Tamam? Or you see something. You know, oh, that person parked again in that parking spot, right? You know, and you start to be affected by those things. That can then take a person's focus and take them to a totally different place, okay? And that it just keeps going, you know, it's like down the rabbit hole. There's just another passing thought that leads to another passing thought that leads to another passing thought. And before you know it, you're like, how did I, how was I even thinking about, like, where did this thought come from? Why am I thinking about this really random thing, especially in the middle of my salah, and I don't even know how I got there. Come on. Okay. Uh, no. So then he says the treatment for that is قَطْعُ هَذِهِ الْأَسْبَابِ بِأَنْ يَغِضَّ بَصَرَهِ So the way to treat that is that you cut off all of these kind of internal stimulations by being in a place where your, uh, your sight is covered. 
that you're praying in an area that is closed off such that you're not seeing things from the outside world that would then distract you. Or that a person uh, prays in their house and it's very dim or dark, such that they're not looking around and seeing other things. Or he doesn't have something in front of him that would attract his senses. Oh, this, uh, for example, Imam al-Ghazali mentions that uh, having a very colorful prayer rug, that could be distracting. Having a very ornamented, designed prayer rug can be distracting. And in the commentary, the Ithaf al-Sa'l of Imam al-Zabidi, he says that one of the worst innovations is these extra ornate masajid with all these etchings everywhere and very uh, overly ornamented. He says one of the worst innovations that has taken place and it's actually not befitting for having presence in the salah. And it's the sunnah of the Prophet and this is a beautiful example, is to actually just have things very simple in the masjid. And some of the most amazing masajid that I've ever been to are very outwardly simple. They're still beautiful, they're very beautiful, but they're simple. You know, there's just, it's just white walls, simple, a prayer carpet, and that's it. Place for the mushaf, place for the, 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 the copy of the Quran, and that's it. And you go in there and you say, SubhanAllah, there's just a, a presence that the place, there's, it brings you to be present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you go to another place and it's got all of these million dollar chandelier and you know imported all of these things and it's overdone now beautifying places is a good thing but it's really about having presence of heart and oh yaqrub min ha'itin says or that you pray close to a wall uh, so that you're not able to see anything beyond the place of your prayer that you just look at the place of your sujood or you're not distracted you can't see anything outside of where you are praying. No. And this is why the people who dedicated themselves to worship, they would often do so in a very small space that was dimly lit. And if you've ever visited the khalwa places of many of the salihin, in many Muslim countries, you can find places where great ulama and great salihin uh, would engage in ibadah. And they're usually very tight. They don't have all these windows and all the, these things coming in. They're usually, or if there is a window, it's kind of covered with a, you know, like a wooden covering or something just to get a little bit of light in. And they're not distracted by anything of the world. It's very simple. And it's almost kind of, you know, cramped. And how many people would actually go and read Quran? And, you know, we hear of the Salihin who would dig their own grave and read do khatams of Qur'an in their graves. Right? Why? Because it helps you have presence of heart. This is, this is, I'm not distracted by anything in the world in a place like this or in a moment like this. No. So you found that many people in this ummah of the great salihin, they would engage in their ibadah in a very small and dimly lit place that was only big enough for them to actually engage in sujood. لِيَكُونَ ذَلِكَ أَجْمَعْ لِلْهَمْ so Because that place helped actually collect all of their focus and remain focused and determined to only be present in the prayer. وَالْأَقْوِيَاءْ مِنْهُمْ And the, those who were, had a, a, a strength and a great ability كَانُوا يَحْضُرُونَ الْمَسَاجِدْ وَيَغُضُّونَ الْبَصَرِ Even when they would attend the prayer in the masjid, they would still keep their sight in the place of their sujood. They wouldn't look around. Even those who had a certain level of experience and steadfastness in their ibadah, even then, to be care they would be careful not to uh, risk losing their presence of heart. Yeah. And the great salihin, they would consider it from the, the completion or the perfection of the prayer is that you are so present in the salah and that you are not distracted by anything around you to such an extent that you don't even know who prayed to your right or to your left. Like let's say you know the person, 
But once the salah is done, he said, oh, that was you? Oh, I wasn't focused on that. That the person was present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this, these are the outward causes and the treatment. The treatment is simple, is that you just minimize your distractions. And even Imam al-Ghazali mentions, and he's going to mention this in the inward distractions, that we have to find ways of collecting ourselves before we enter into the salah. And that's one of the great wisdoms of even having these sunnah prayers and uh, supererogatory prayers before the fard prayer so that we are continuing to deepen our level of presence and prepare ourselves to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that we say the, you know, ayatul kursi and various, and various invocations before we enter into the salah to help collect ourselves and to be present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those are the outward distractions and how to uh, deal with them and the treatment for them. As for the inward distractions, Imam al-Ghazali says, فَهِيَ أَشَدْ This is even more difficult than the outward. Outward is just turn off the lights, be present, turn off your phone, don't think about anything else and just pray. But the inward, he said, is more difficult. فَإِنَّ مَنْ تَشَعَّبَتْ بِهِ الْهُمُومُ فِي أَوْدِيَةِ الدُّنْيَا لَمْ يَنْحَصَرْ فِكْرُهُ فِي فَنٍ وَاحِدٍ So whoever's concerns are taken through the valleys of the various uh, uh, channels of worldliness, they won't just be thinking about one thing alone. A person might, if they see something, say, what's that noise? And they think about that. But if a person has an internal distraction, they can be taken to all different types of places. بَلْ لَا يَزَالُ يَطْلِلُ مِنْ جَانِبٍ إِلَى جَانِبٍ That their, their thoughts are flying from one area to the next. In terms of, you know, vastly different khawatir and passing thoughts that might not come to them. And Imam al-Ghazali is saying, if a person, even if they're in a place where there are no outward distractions, that they're in a small room and it's dark, that that doesn't prevent them, that doesn't save them from these types of inward distractions, okay? So he says, uh, uh, so the way to deal with that is أن يرد النفس قهرا إلى فهم ما يقرأه في الصلاة ويشغلها به عن غيره That the first thing is to force, and this is a really a beautiful and powerful word, one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Qahar, the one who is overpowering and dominating, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he, this is the word that's used here, and yarud the nafsa qahran, that a person dominates and forces the nafs to return back to contemplating and understanding the words that are being recited in the salah. Okay? And to focus and to force it to focus on that over all other things. And what helps a person do that is that they prepare before they enter into the prayer and that they remind themselves of the hereafter and that they will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the result of that judgment is, is significant, is so significant and dangerous that they need to think of that in the moment of the salah. Okay? That it is such an intense, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the, the disbelievers on that day, subhanAllah, I just learned the meaning of this ayah recently, that the disbelievers on that day, they when they see the scales and when they see the judgment, they will be in such terror that they will look up and their eyes will be in such horror that they'll be wide-eyed and they won't even be able to blink for how many Years will they be experiencing that where it will be so intense that they won't even be able to blink? So you remind yourself of that in the salah. What would I be like if I was true and I am? But if the veil was lifted and I'm standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what kind of adab and presence would I have? So you remind your nafs of that. وَيُفَرِّقْ قَلْبَهُ قَبْلَ التَّحْرِيمِ بِالصَّلَاةِ عَمَّا يَهُمُهُ فَلَا يَتْرُكِ نَفْسِ شُغْلًا يَلْتَفِتُ إِلَيْهِ خَاطِرُهُ So uh, this is a really 
practical and beautiful reminder that Imam al-Ghazali gives us. And he says, another practical thing you can do before entering the prayer is that if you have any, anything that you're doing and you want to tie some loose ends, you know, that you're, you have something on the, in the oven, you have, you know, something that you're waiting for, there's something going on that is occupying your thoughts that you actually finish doing those things and that comes to an end before you engage in the prayer. Because then he's, oh, my alarm's going off. It's still not, it's going to burn. Uh, I'm waiting for this important phone call. A person's constantly going to be thinking about those things in the salah. That you try your very best to, uh, you know, tie all those loose ends so that when you enter into the salah, there's nothing on your mind. You know, one of the things that we have to do is, you know, put our phones on silent, maybe even put it in a totally different room and just enjoy the salah. When we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, we will not regret, oh, that phone call I missed or that text message I missed and whatever it may have been for those moments that we are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just having, you know, practically taking the, the means available to us, anything that's, that's, oh, I have to write this email, oh, it's extremely, do that, and then engage in the prayer with presence of heart. Naam. So Imam al-Ghazali says, this is how you actually calm yourself from all of these various thoughts, okay? And then he says, how do you deal with it at the root? So this is, he's saying, this is helpful for, just having these passing thoughts that are coming through to kind of deal with them in the moment. But then he says, how do you deal with it at the root? And he says, you have to look at these things that are occupying your mind, that busy you, and you have to say, where is the source from which they're coming from? And Imam al-Ghazali says, the things that busy you are the things that you find important. You're not going to think about things that are not important to you. So he says, and then you realize that those things that are important to you, if they're distracting you in the salah, and they're, they seem more important in that moment than what you're actually in, he says that those stem from your desires. Those thoughts stem from what's important to you. What's important to you, if it's getting in the way of your salah, it stems from your shahawat, stems from your desires. So then the way that a person disciplines the nafs is by cutting off those attachments. It is really trying to uproot those desires and cutting off those attachments. And really that is freedom. You know, now even in a material sense, people are talking about, you know, minimalism and things of that nature. You know, what you own, owns you. And not living like, like that anymore. But actually realizing that there's so man, many more meaningful things, even in a worldly sense, more than all of these things that occupy us. So you have to get to the root of it and cut that out. Because everything that distracts that person in his salah is contradictory to his deen. And it is the soldiers of Iblis and one of his, uh, uh, the Muslims' enemies. So holding on to that thing. And he mentions the story of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is for us to learn. That the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, he had a ring. And he, when he was giving the khutbah, he delivered the khutbah. And he would look at his new ring ﷺ. And then he said, this ring has distracted me and he gave it away, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to teach us how you break those attachments. And if this is getting in the way, I'm going to give it away. I don't need it. And that way I will be light before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then uh, finally, he tells us a few stories of some of the Sahaba. So, Aba Talha uh, that Abu Talha, he was pr pr uh, praying in an enclosed place where he had some trees there. So as he was praying, he saw a little bird that flew from the trees 
And he was impressed by the beauty of the bird. So he said that his eyesight followed the bird. So when he was done, he mentioned to the Messenger of Allah the tribulation that he was afflicted with. Look at the level of the Sahaba. It's a bird flying. The tribute, but he's, this got in the way of my salah, so this is one of my enemies. And one of the things that is harming my deen. So then he said to the Prophet وسلم, I give away that those trees in that area that I was praying in, that I own, I give it away sadaqah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want it anymore. He let go of it. And another, uh, 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 another man did the same thing and he gave it to Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan and Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan sold that garden for 50,000 uh, uh, dirhams or dinars. That he sold it for 50,000. It was very valuable. He got rid of it because it got in the way of his deen. So we have to really, Imam al-Ghazali, he's going deep. If you want to uproot the tree that is bearing rotten fruit, you have to uproot it. So they did that so they could cut off the source of all of these passing thoughts. And also as an expiation for their shortcomings in the salah. So this is the medicine, this is the treatment. And it is bitter. It is difficult, but this is the treatment. Because what we mentioned about forcing your nafs to listen to what's being said in the salah, that's a, a temporary, easier approach, and it won't solve the problem long term. Okay? So he says, and that works for weak desires. But if someone loves the world, then they won't be able to do that. And then finally, he gives us this, this example. He says, it's like a man who is trying to focus and he just wants to reflect and he's sitting under a tree and he just wants peace of mind. And every so often a bird comes and starts chirping above his head and flying in the branches and just takes a branch and he hits the bird and it flies away. And then it comes right back. He hits the bird and it flies away. So like, now I can think. The bird comes right back. He hits it again. And then someone tells him, you got to cut down the tree. You got to figure out a way. You know, we're not, now when we're, you know, more environmentally conscious, people don't like that. But he's saying you have to cut down the tree of the desires so that the bird of these passing thoughts has nothing to come back to. And then you can actually sit and think and be present. You know? No. La ilaha illallah. And he said all of these desires, if you really get to the, the source of it and the heart of it, it is love of the world. And you have to really strive and struggle against that. And he says, nobody is perfect. He said, there are very few people who can have you know, a prayer that is completely filled with presence of heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, la matma' fihi li amthali. Now that's from his humility. So someone like us doesn't have hope in that. And even for us just to have half of it or a third of it safe from these insinuations and these whisperings, even that's an improvement. Even that's an improvement. He said at the very least we'll have mixed some good with our shortcomings. But what he's telling us here is once again not to make us lose hope, but rather to say that we have to work hard and we have to do better. So he says, it's like the love of the world and having presence of heart, it's like one vessel. Your heart is like one vessel. And love of the world is like vinegar. And presence of heart with Allah is like water. So the two are not ever gonna mix. But he said, the more water you pour in, the more it will eventually push out the vinegar and fill it up. Which gives us hope to say that wherever we are, we just strive to do a little bit better, and then a little bit better, and a little bit better. And it's about consistency and really seeking uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance and support. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullahu khayran. And inshallah, I will transition shortly. Uh, to session four, the inner meanings of prayer. And this is really beautiful. Please, you know, this is 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, everything is leading to, inshaAllah ta'ala. Jazakumullahu khayran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. So we've reached the final session, session number four. And what we'll be doing in this session is looking at the inner meanings of prayer. So one of the things that Imam Ghazali does in this book is that he first starts, he walks us through the prayer in relation to the outward meanings. And so he talks about these same uh, stations of the prayer that we're going to be talking about now in relation to fiqh, the outward dimension. What are the legal rulings of them? And then what he does is he goes back through and then he starts to speak about their spiritual meaning. And this is extremely, extremely helpful. And this is something that is not enough to just go through this once. It's not too hard to understand. As we will see, the meanings are fairly clear. But this is something that we want to take good notes and remind ourselves of regularly. And to go back to these meanings because these are the meanings in addition to what we've already heard that are going to bring the prayer to life. This is what's going to make your prayer of a much greater qualitative value. And so he begins with the Adhan. And so one of the meanings of the Adhan that we can bring to heart is, he says, is to bring to mind the dreadful summons on the day of resurrection. So on the day of resurrection, we're all standing before Allah. Every single human being will wait for his or her name to be called. And so when we hear the Adhan, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, internally, we should re remind ourselves that we're going to hear our name called on the Day of Judgment. We're all going to be summoned. We're all going to be resurrected and then driven to the plane of judgment. So immediately, and Imam Sha'arani notes, and it's really helpful, that the Adhan, the Iqamah, and the Takbir, the Haram prayer, all begin with Allahu Akbar. The Adhan begins with Allahu Akbar, the call to commence begins with Allahu Akbar, and the prayer begins with Allahu Akbar. So the meaning of Allahu Akbar is central to our preparation for prayer and then entering into it. It's central to how it is that we are in prayer. And that's coming when we get to what is called the takbir or ihram. So the Adhan, we bring to mind the summoning of Yawm al Qiyam of the day of resurrection. And his advice to us then is to what? Devote yourself inwardly and outwardly to responding to this call and hastening to fulfill what it is calling to. So the Adhan is a pivotal moment there. And unfortunately, we don't get to hear the Adhan as much as you would if you were in the Muslim country. It's one of the beauties of being in the Muslim world is here in the Adhan. We're deprived of that oftentimes, unfortunately. And uh, there was a question earlier about uh, the other Adhans, um, and that as Ustad Amjad mentioned, it's good that we call the Adhan. We should be calling the Adhan. So in your home, when you are playing that one congregational prayer, have someone call the Adhan. And again, that in the absence of it, it's perfectly fine to use prayer apps in a fudger clock or something to remind you that the prayer is entered. But in addition to that, also call the Adhan. Because this is now that in our minds, when we hear this, now we transition. Something's wanted from us now that we have to prepare for. So again, getting ourselves ready for prayer and devoting ourselves to the preparation that of it. And that we know that and specifically, and specifically in relation to the Adhan, that our Prophet used to say, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Uh, Give us rest by it, O Bilal. And so that our Prophet said, because his quarter to Ain is that his true pleasure and his true joy was in prayer, he was longing for the Adhan. And that's what Rahim Raha and repose is that now it's time to stand before Allah. And again, we're only doing it obligatorily five times a day. It could have been much more. But those are moments that, subhanAllah, if we focus on the prayer, everything else in the spiritual path opens up after that. This is it. This is where we begin. If we want to talk about spiritual, the spiritual path, it begins here with the prayer. 
So then the next meaning is purification. So we're going to get ready for prayer then. And we purify, just as we purify our limbs outwardly by putting water on them, we purify our heart by repenting from sin. So as we are putting that water on our face, it is a means to cleanse us outwardly, but also we're thinking about everything that we've done that with our eyes, seeking forgiveness from Allah, as we are putting water on our arms, as we're rinsing our mouth, and so forth and so on. Is that this is a means of cleansing and purification of our limbs, but also our heart. And so this is a time when we purify ourselves, is that we also purify our heart by repenting from sin, having remorse what we've done in the past, and resolving never to fall short again. So the Adhan, this is reminiscent of being summoned by, to Allah. And purification and all of its meanings of everything that we've done on our limbs and our heart. And then, of course, we have to have clean clothing. And just as we have certain substances that might get on our clothes or on our bodies or on the place of prayer that prevent the validity of the prayer, likewise, there are that certain that other substances that are that substances not necessarily outwardly, inwardly, that stain our hearts and prevent them from that receiving the meanings that they are supposed to receive. So purification in both of its meanings, actual will do itself, and then cleansing our clothes and things like that, removing any type of filth or najas or anything like that. And then is that covering ourselves? There's a particular way that we dress for prayer. And there's, of course, the obligations that the scholars have said, what is called the aura, our legal nakedness. And we have to know that in relation to the outward dimension of prayer. There are certain things that, can, that have to be covered. But then, likewise, just as we cover parts of our body that are unbefitting for other people to see, but what about the state of our heart? What is unbefitting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see that's in our heart? There is no veil that can conceal that from Allah. So we have to think about that meaning. There are certain things that are not appropriate for other people to see, so we cover them. What a blessing from Allah. And likewise is that we have to cover up these meanings that are in our heart with forgiveness. By asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. And then what we're going to do after this is that we face the qibla. Okay, so we've heard the adhan that we have purified ourselves and then we're going to face the qibla. So you're going to actually go towards the place of prayer. And outwardly you're orienting yourself in a particular direction. So facing the qibla means you outwardly turn your face away from every other direction toward the house of Allah. Precisely by facing one particular direction, you are not facing any other direction. So you're facing that single direction. You're turning away, in a sense, from all those other directions towards the direction you are facing. And the meaning here is, turn your heart away from every other matter and toward Allah. So outwardly, you're turning away from every other direction except where you're facing. And inwardly, you're turning your heart towards Allah. Like, imagine if you bring that to mind over and over again, over and over again how your whole experience of prayer will entirely change. And that statement, that the story, or the, uh, the statement of Hatim and Asam, that Ustad Amjad mentioned, let's review that. I want to make sure everybody got that down. So what did he say when he, that when he was asked uh, about how he prayed? Okay, what was the first thing that he did? Okay, so before that, he would sit down in his place of prayer and gather himself. Okay? So then he stands up for prayer. And what, is, what does he bring to mind? The Kaaba, heard it, is right before him. Okay? And the Sirat, the traverse, which is the bridge over the hellfire, is right beneath him. And then what else? 
Jannah is on his right, and the Nar Nasallahu is on his left. So the Kaaba is before him. He imagines Jannah to the right, Nar to the left, and he's standing on the Sirat. And then the Angel of Death is right behind him. He doesn't know whether this is going to be his last prayer or not. And there's more to that, but if we can remember that, this is the time where we would bring this to heart. When we first start to face the Qibla, and you imagine that you're right before the Kaaba, and all of those other powerful mashahid, that will force the heart to be present. That will force the heart to be present when we think about those things. So facing the Qibla, you're turning your heart away from every other matter. And then the Iqama, which is the call to commence, is that we bring to heart the imminence of the meeting with Allah. Because the Adhan is recommended to be prolonged. So that, you know, when it's resolved, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Whereas the Iqama is recited quickly. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And depending upon how they're both recited differently, they have a different effect upon you. This is the that iqama, the call to commence. Khalas, prayer is about to begin. And it's the meeting with Allah is imminent. And so that affects you in a different way. So you hear the call to commence and you bring to mind the imminence that's about to happen of the meeting with Allah. And then we have the standing position. So we're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we are standing before Allah, is that we realize in our souls, in our hearts, the greatness of speaking intimately with Allah. That we are standing right before Allah. And what a blessing. This is how prayer begins in the standing position. And we will all be standing before Allah on the Day of Judgment. Standing. This is that a special that act of the acts of prayer and when we are worshiping. And so that we are standing before Allah and we bring to heart that we are before Him. And when we slightly lower our heads, which is the sunnah, is that this is an indication of humility. You'd slightly lower your head out of humility that you're standing before your Lord. And again, we remind ourselves just as we are standing before Allah, now for prayer, that we are going to be standing before him on the Day of Judgment. And then we make the intention. And we have to memorize the intention that we make outwardly, according to the sacred law. But in doing so, we want to remind ourselves, especially at this time, of sincerity. This is for Allah. And in some schools, says that this is exactly what you do. So for instance, we just prayed Salat al-Dhuhr, Nawaitu, Fadd al-Dhuhr, Arba Raka'as. Right? You mentioned what is that the obligatory things to mention, Ma'mumen, that Lillahi Ta'ala. This is for Allah. So you remind yourself at the intention, at the level of the intention, this is for Allah. In addition to, the outward intention that you're making, specifying the prayer, and whether it's hard or not, and so forth. Okay? So, we have the Adhan, we have the state of purification, cleansing the body from its impurities, covering the body, facing the Qibla, calling the Iqama, standing before Allah, making the intention, and then, now we're ready to say the Takbir al ihram And one thing the scholars mentioned is good, is to recite Surat al Surat al Nas. That's recommended. So Kul A'udhu Bir Bin Nas. It's one of the ways to help you from waswasa, the whisperings of Shaitan, is that just before you enter into your prayer, you recite Surat al Nas. Okay, so then we're going to say the Takbira al Ihram. So the Takbira is a single instance of saying Allahu Akbar. And the idea of ihram here is, just as we say ihram and hajj, is the state of pilgrim sanctity. 
Once you make the intention to enter into a state of pilgrim sanctity, certain things that are permissible are now haram. Certain things now, once you enter into the prayer, Allahu Akbar, the moment before you said that, they were permissible. You can talk, you can eat, you can move, however you want to move. But once you say Allahu Akbar, khalas. You can't talk, you can't eat, you can't do other things. Laugh. This is the time to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you shouldn't be texting on your phone or anything else. I always remember that story that one of our teachers said that he actually saw someone answer his that cell phone in prayer. So he pulls out his cell phone and he says, Oh, suddenly, I'm praying. And he put his cell phone away. You don't want to do that. That would actually that break your prayer. So when you say, Takbirat ya haram, Allah Akbar, is that they say that by lifting your hands, you're making intention to throw the dunya behind your back. Khalas. The world, you throw it behind your back completely. You're ridding yourself of it. Allahu Akbar. And when you say this, that we need to make sure, we should strive at least, that nothing is greater to us than Allah. Nothing is greater to us than Allah. So that when our tongue says Allahu Akbar, our heart does not belie it. If there's anything in our hearts in that moment that is greater, to us than Allah, then we're not truthful in our saying of Allahu Akbar, even though that's what's, that's truth. And so if your desires have more power over you than the commandment of Allah, and so forth and so on, and you're more obedient to them than you are to Allah, then you have taken them as a God with a lowercase g and pronounced the takbir for them. And so, that when we say Allahu Akbar, this is an opportunity for us to have complete concentration as we enter into our prayer. And one of the blessings is, at every stage of the prayer, with a few exceptions, we're saying Allahu Akbar. So we really want to reflect upon the importance of Allahu Akbar, and to make sure we bring that meaning to heart when we say it. Because it's a way to get us back. So if, we, if our mind starts thinking about other things in the standing position, is that when we go into the bowing position, we're going to say, Allahu Akbar. And when we come out, we say, Sima Allah, but then when we go into sujood, we say, Allahu Akbar. And so it's a way to always bring yourself back. So use the Allahu Akbar as a way to be present with Allah throughout your prayer. Bring yourself back. Your mind strays, bring yourself back. From the beginning of the prayer until the end. And then, uh, in some schools, there is what's called the opening supplication. This is in the Shafi school and the Hanafi school. Have their, both have their versions of what is known as the Duat Istiftah. In the Maliki school, of course, they're in a far prayer, they're saying Allahu Akbar, and immediately saying Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And these are valid differences of the great Imams. But in the Shafi school, you are that saying Allahu Akbar Kabira, Walhamdulillah Kathir, or SubhanAllah, Bukratan Wasila. And then you're saying, What jahdu wa jalilli fatara samuati wrote. I turn my face to him who created the heavens and the earth. In other words, you are now directing your heart to Allah. And this is one of the most special moments of all in life are those moments where we are present with Allah of, and we're in a state of iqbal. And the meaning of being in a state of iqbal is that you are directing your heart to Allah. Aware fully that He sees you, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and with the requisite lowliness and humility and brokenness that we should have before Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prayer is deep. It's deep. And we have to work on our prayer and practice our prayers like anything else. You, Stephen Curry, did not become the best three-point shooter ever just by, yeah, he, because he's the son of Dale Curry, right? He has incredible work ethic, day in and day out, day in and day out, always trying to perfect his craft and his skills. And if people do this for dunya, how much more are we, should we be doing this for the hereafter? This takes work to perfect this. Prayer takes work to perfect it. It's not enough to just, okay, I'm going to... This takes work, and we have to make it a priority. But there's nothing more important for us to perfect than our prayers. 
This is what we want to perfect. And we want to get this right. So the opening supplication, if we're reciting that according to our school, the intention there is we're directing our essence to Allah. And then we're saying, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeem. This is what is known as the Ta'awwul. We are seeking refuge in Allah from Shaitan. And one of the wisdoms of the Ta'awwul is, we, are real, we realize that we are unable to protect our own selves except through the power of Allah. We cannot be protected unless Allah protects us. Shaitan is our avowed enemy whom we do not see. And the only way to protect ourselves from shaitan is to let turn to Allah Taala and seek his help and to take refuge in him. And then Allah Taala will assist us. So it's a very powerful meaning. A'udhu billahi min shaitan when we say it like that, we're seeking, but again, all of these meanings always are taking us back to Allah. They always take us back to Allah. A'udhu billah, seeking refuge in Allah from shaitan. And then we're going to recite the Fatiha. And again, we want to outwardly learn how to recite the Fatiha correctly. And sit with someone who's trained in Tajweed to get your recitation correct, at least according to the bare minimum. And then we want to really reflect upon learn the basic meanings that we can reflect upon as we're reciting the Fatiha. And of course, the Fatiha is an ocean, but there are basic meanings that we can bring to mind as we're reciting it. So when we say, Bismillah rahman rahim we bring to heart that we know that absolutely everything is from Allah. In addition to that, we begin in His name, seeking His help in all of our affairs. Some say that bad for isti'ana, seeking the help of Allah. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Everything is from Allah seeking His help in everything this that we do. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. That we have deep seated gratitude in our hearts for all of Allah's blessing, all of His blessings, and we praise Him. And then, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. And again, we've already said Ar Rahman Ar Rahim and Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And now we're even repeating a second time, emphasizing the centrality and the importance of mercy is that we bring to heart the comprehensive mercy of Allah in all of the meanings that the scholars say of Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Maliki yawmid deen. And now this is where it gets Jalali. So it goes from Jamal to Jalal. That Maliki yawmid deen. That he is the king or the possessor of the day of judgment, yawmid deen. And so we bring to heart fear of the standing before Allah, before the King on the day of reckoning. And then we say, <laughs> You alone do we worship. So we renew our sincerity. <laughs> and so imagine if we're actually present with Allah, with that meaning in our prayer, at least 17 times a day in the Fard prayers. How that will help us to have sincerity in everything it is that we do and actually renew our sincerity before every act. And that we also, that second part of that verse, and we're aware of our absolute need of Allah. Now we seek His help. Guide us to the straight path. So we're in need of guidance. And then we're asking for guidance, but then We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are people that he has guided, that he's bestowed his favor upon. Those are the people that we want to be like. And here, what are we intending? So we say, اِهْدِنَا صَرَاتُ مُسْتَقِيمُ سَرَاتَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Those who you bestowed your favor upon. And we know uh, in another verse, Allah Ta'ala says that وَمَنْ يُتِئِ اللَّهِ الرَّسُولِ so again, there's a mission of in'am. An'am Allah alim. Allah has bestowed His grace upon them. Min al-Nabiyyin wa Siddiqin wa Shuhada wa Sadiqin. Four categories. So what is our intention? None of us can be prophets. But when we say, Ihdina sirat al-Mustaqim, sirat al-Ladin an'amta alim, where is our aspiration? Do we just want to be good? Or is our aspiration to be from the Sadiqin? Is our aspiration to be from the Shuhada? Or is our aspiration to be from the Siddiqin? We should make the intention 
Two, that Allah Ta'ala make us from the elect of the elect of His creation. And that we want to not just be from the lower ranks of those that He's bestowed His favor upon, but those who have high ranks. So we should make that intention every time we recite the Fatiha. Surat al Alim, Ghayr al Mawdub Alim wa al the two main archetypes of misguidance. The Mawdub Alim are those who have incurred Allah's wrath. They know, but they fail to put into practice. And the Dalin are those who go astray without knowledge. Those are the main two archetypes of the different ways that people go astray. And then we're going to proceed after that to recitation of the Qur'an. And the Imam Ghazali in another place that he speaks about three degrees of recitation. The lowest of which is to bring to mind that we are standing before Allah. We're reciting before Allah. The second is is that we bring to mind that Allah Ta'ala is addressing us individually. And of course, the first one that was addressed was the Prophet Sallallahu and by extension, that others. But we bring to mind that Allah is addressing us directly with His words. And then the third is one where someone moves up in the degrees of spiritual realization. Where is that they witness the one speaking in the speech. And that's a lofty spiritual state. We speak about it because we want to know that it exists and we love the people who have attained that great degree. And we're inspired by their stories. So we strive to ascend in the degrees of recitation. And then we, after this, is that when we recite, and this is really helpful, and actually could be turned into a whole other seminar in and of itself. And in fact, the next retreat that we're having at Al-Maqasid is on book 8 of the Ahiyyul Madin, of the book of the etiquettes of recitation of Qur'an. So Imam Musaidi will go into a little bit more detail what he mentions here fairly briefly. He just gives here some small things that we can use as tools to help us reflect. And so he says that every time that you see a command in the Qur'an, the etiquette is that you have resolve to put it into practice. Every time that you see a prohibition in the Qur'an, you have resolve to avoid it. Every time you see a promise in the Qur'an is that you have hope that you are from those that are recipients of that promise. Every time that there's a warning or threat in the Qur'an, there's fear. Every time that there's an admonition is that you take heed. The stories of the prophets, you learn the lessons that are behind those. That every time there's a mention of his blessings upon us is that you show gratitude. And so it's meant that as we recite the Qur'an that all of this is coming out of our heart. This is how we're responding to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then after that, we're going to go into the bowing position. And look at how subhanAllah, that was said, Amjad mentioned the hadith, how the closest that a servant is to his Lord is when he's in a state of prostration. And how you're in the state of standing. And then you go into the bowing state. And this is a, a state where now, we are humbling ourselves before Allah. And this is a great opportunity for us to show our reverence and to be in awe of Him, the powerful King, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to glorify Him. And this is what we say, subhanahu rabbi al-azim. And bring into heart that we are bowing humbly before Him while glorifying Him. Then we're standing up and we're straightening up and that we're saying, Simi Allahu liman hamida. Saying that Allah Ta'ala that responds to those who praise Him. Those who praise Him, Allah responds to them. He answers their call. That He, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, shows His mercy to His lowly servants. Rabbana wa lakal hamd. What a reminder. Simi Allahu, Allah hears us. And He answers our prayers, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. So we're going back up. And now we're preparing ourselves for the position where we're closest to our Lord. Now we say, Allahu Akbar, and we go into sushut. And if we have humility in the bowing position, this is when we are in the utmost state of humility. Completely broken and feel that we're in absolute need of Allah. We should love sujood. Sujood should be beloved to us. 
Subhanallah. And from the blessing of Allah, He gives us an opportunity to go into sujood, and we've been prepared for that from everything that proceeds. And this is where we show our utmost humility to Him. And then we come out of sujood, and we sit in that reverent way that we're taught to sit. And there's du'as that we can say, Rabbu fili, Rabbu fili. repeat that, or that other du'as that have been narrated by the Prophet But then now to emphasize the importance of sujood, we go back a second time. Sujood could have only been once. But Allah made us prostrate twice in our prayer. So utter humility, we come out, and then again, we prostrate again. Repeating what it is that we said in the previous sujood. And then if it is the, depending upon what cycle of prayer it is, we're going to go into the tashahud. The tashahud is the testification of faith. And it's here in the tashahud that we're reminded of how we got the prayer in the first place. The greatness of prayer, one of the again, ways that we can come to this is how was the prayer revealed? Where do we get the prayer? We've all heard this probably many times before. On the Layl Isra al Mi'raj, when our Prophet ﷺ was in the Divine Presence where no one else went before him or after him and even Gabriel السلام, couldn't go with him in the Divine Presence. And so the Prophet ﷺ comes back from the Divine Presence with the gift of prayer. And the prayer is the ascension of the believer. That meaning is correct. It's the way that we ascend. And so when we say that the shahad, at tahiyat, al mubarakat, as salawat al tayyibat lillah, as salamu alayka, ayyuha nabiyu, wa rahmatullahi wa barakat, as salamu alayna, wa ala ibadillahi salihin, is that now this shows the connection to the mi'raj of the Prophet. Now how this is an individual opportunity for you and I to be present with Allah Ta'ala and to ascend through the prayer. And so we should learn all of those details of the meanings of the tashahud. And then of course that we, a part of that tashahud is ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammad rasulullah. We testify to the oneness of Allah and we bear witness that our Prophet Sallallahu is the Messenger of Allah and we're sitting in that unique position with our right foot up, with the utmost adab and manners, proclaiming that all the prayers, all the good and all the wholesome things that we may do belong ultimately to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after this, we are going to send salawat upon the Prophet Sallallahu And you, as that they mention, is that you visualize the noble person of the Prophet ﷺ in your heart and send salutations to him with love and longing to be with him. Allah would have not put the salam to the Prophet ﷺ in the heart unless that's what he wanted you to focus on. And in fact that we say to him, As-salamu alayka. We're not saying As-salamu alayhi. You're saying, peace be upon you, which is the kaf al-khitab, the second person. Peace be upon you. And that's what Allah wants you to focus on in that moment. And this indicates the importance of the Prophet ﷺ. And everybody else in prayer, while you're praying, if someone sends salams to you, you just wave to them. But were someone to have lived during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and were he to have said salam alaykum to them, it, while they're in prayer, it's an obligation to return his salam. And there's deep, deep spiritual meaning there. Deep spiritual meaning there. And this actually happened where the Prophet sent salams and asked him, why didn't you return the salams to me? Even if you're in prayer before Allah and Rasulullah sent the salams, you have to return salams to him. There's deep meanings there. And people that are masakeen, that are cut off from these loki meanings, these experiential meanings of love in connection to the Prophet and who don't understand these types of things, are cutting themselves off from one of the most important things of all in this religion. And unfortunately, if we don't have those connections, let alone that if we deny them, is that 
This is preventing us from withstanding the onslaught of the evil in any time, but especially in the end of time. These are meanings that are foundational to help us withstand as believers that the onslaught of the events of the end of time especially. And more specifically, ta'allam, connecting our hearts to the Prophet loving him, having an intimate relationship with him وسلم, and that sending abundant salawat upon him, reading his life story and recognizing that he is alive in his grave. And the only thing between us and meeting with him is death and dying in a good state. This is how the companions were. This is how we want to be. This is the reality of this deen. And so that when we're sending these salawat, that we are imagining the Prophet ﷺ, that sending these blessings upon him and peace on him with love and longing. And then there's some beautiful supplications that have been narrated about what it is that we say, uh, that towards the end of the prayer, and this is a time where du'a is mustajab. It's a time where prayers are answered. It's a time to supplicate to Allah and to turn to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we make taslim, i.e. we say salam alaikum. And there's different ways of doing this in the different schools. But in the Shafi school, you say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Making the intention to exit the prayer but to also greet the angels and those present from the believers. And so this is the way that we exit the prayer. And now, once we say in the Shafi school, Assalamu Alaikum, like the Maliki school, even though it's recommended to say more in the Shafi school, your prayer is finished. It's recommended to say, Warahmatullah, and then another Tasneem to the left. But then the important thing here is how we are right after the prayer. We don't want to be from people, those people who just pray super quickly. Once the person, somebody going to somebody going to right, and we're off, right. This is a time that mercy descends. This is a time where it's, there's sakina. There is that a lot of that tranquility in these moments. Uh, we don't. We want to remain in our spots for a minute, and that we want to bring to heart that that might have been the last prayer that we ever get to pray. And what is the first thing to do that Sunnah say after prayer is to say Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. You've just prayed, but you're saying Astaghfirullah. Teaching us to be broken before Allah, even if we've done something that's good. And we combine between the two emotions of fear and hope. We hope that our prayer is accepted, that we fear that it's been rejected. And so immediately after the prayer, as we're doing our invocations, like how we should be after the day of fasting, this is a time to be present with Allah. And on one hand, you're thankful for Allah having enabled you to pray, having to fast that day, but at the same time, you're between fear and hope. You don't know if it's going to be accepted, or you don't know if it's going to be rejected. And then we ask Allah, Rabbana taqabbal minna. We ask Him to accept our prayers. And one of the great signs they mention about that our prayers have been accepted is that we've asked Allah to accept them. And we want to get in the habit of doing this in all of the different things that we do, all the different acts of goodness that we do. And so this is how we are after the prayer. And then all of these meanings, even though this is a lot, this is a lot. And even if you try to implement this right off the bat, you're like, wow, this is overwhelming. I can't remember all this, right, in my prayers. You begin little by little. Start with a few of them. But you have to go back to this material time and time again. It's not enough just to go over it one time. You'll forget it. By Maghrib prayer, let alone Isha, let alone tomorrow, let alone after that, you'll forget it. That you want to come back to it time and time again, time and time again, to remind uh, yourselves of this, and this is what we're all in need of, uh, to remind ourselves of these blessed meanings. And that with that, inshallah ta'ala, I think that we will wrap it up in Lee, we have about a few minutes for questions. We didn't let, not allow any uh, time for Q&A in the previous session. So we'll allow just a few minutes for questions. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless these to be realities within us and to pray the way that the elect of his righteous have prayed and to worship in a way that is pleasing to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and give us insight into this religion and to come together time and time again and helping one another uh, to, to be people of taqwa, helping one another to be people of piety, 
صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين do you have any questions i think if we would ever i think if we would ever legislate uh, the permissibility of beating another man in the masjid it would be for that reason like it is a really serious thing um, and it is really incredibly unfortunate that it happens so often because of the type of clothing that people wear um, you know and it's something that we have to collectively just solve and um, you know yes I think at first if it happens the first time you know it's always good to remind our brothers with etiquette and that type of thing but it happens over and over again we should get more and more from because that's just so incredibly foul and um, anyhow I think everybody knows what she's referring to so I'm not going to be any more explicit but aside from that I think the answer to your question is um, I think you have to simplify it, right? So uh, everything that you're learning here, we've gone into a little bit of detail. I would just simplify it for them, right? Some of the, 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 the main meanings, just you know, a few main points of things that you want them to think about throughout their entire prayer. So that, that's what I would do is to simplify this and do kind of a child's version. Now, I know that Fons Vite has a Ghazali for Prayer for Children's series. Um, I'm not that familiar with how they treat the prayer, but you might want to look into that for some ideas. You might get some ideas to help you with that. But in general, that would be the recommendations to really simplify it and to have them like, attached to the overarching meanings. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on the significance of the speed of the Adhan versus the Aqama. Yeah, so the... the the tamdi to draw out the adhan is is recommended, right? And really, that the adhan, the purpose there is to let people know that prayer is is it's the prayer time has entered, right? So what's befitting for that is kind of an extended adhan in, in each uh, the word that you say, so that those meanings resonate with the hearts of the people. Um, whereas the iqama, when you say something kind of quickly. When you recite something, it has a different effect on you, right? So the fact that it's kind of like being extended, the Adhan, is that gives you ample time to really think about those meanings and to transition into, okay, now it's time for prayer. But the idea there is that you're getting ready for the prayer and that type of thing, and you're preparing yourself and making wudu. And then, once you hear the Iqama, right, it's more like now, prayer is imminent, it's about to happen. And prayer is meeting with Allah. This is munaja, the intimate conversation with Allah. And so that the meaning there, as I've understood it, is that it's to, you know, create that sense in you of the imminence of something. This says when something's done kind of quickly, it just, you know, readies you internally to, to, to situate you for what it is that you're about to do. Uh, the first question that I have is about having wudu inside the bathroom. I, in Palestine, for example, people used to have um, sinks outside the bathroom itself, so they can have they can say and recite prayers while or like maybe out while they're yeah. making the wudu. We don't have it here. Yeah. Um, the second the second thing is that it's something that I, that I see in the mosques where people actually um, don't put their their feet exactly next to each other, so they don't touch. Is that an obligation that the feet touch feet to feet and shoulder to yeah. shoulder, yeah. or is it actually permissible that people? Because I see lack, like laxity in, 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 in how people do that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I right. wonder about the validity of my prayer. Sure. So the first thing is is that um, yeah, uh, usually that in the way in many of the restrooms that we freshen up in is that there are stalls very close to the places that we make wudu. And you will find some scholars who say that the stall itself, in, inside of it, is the bathroom area. Um, and then outside of that, um, is, it's permissible to remember Allah Ta'ala, because you're outside of the place where actually, because there's a wall there, even though it's a stall and it's open on the top and it's open on the bottom. Um, if it's a room that's closed off, as in some bathrooms and some houses have it, Definitely, if that door is closed, then you're definitely out of the bathroom when you use the sink. 
Um, so you do have that, um, you will find scholars that permit the mentioning of Allah Ta'ala outside of the actual bathroom itself. Um, I still personally choose to do it in my heart. I don't like to do it, even if there's, st even if there's stalls there. Um, so, um, you know, there, there's, there are opinions there, but uh, uh, you kind of you have a choice there, kind of what you want to do there. Um, as for the prayer, the most important thing is that you line up with people shoulder to shoulder. Okay? And the asal is, is that your feet are only supposed to be a hand span apart. So I know some people feel like they absolutely have to like stretch their feet out like that to touch the other people's feet. That's not an obligation, definitely. So your prayer is valid, 100%. The most important thing that you want to align up is you want to make sure uh, is that your, your heels are lined up with everyone else's heels. So you're not before people or you're not behind people. And you're lined up shoulder to shoulder. Um, and there are indications where sometimes people to make sure would extend their feet. Uh, but in general, the most important thing is to line up shoulder to shoulder and not be too far behind or too far ahead. Because in some schools, they line up with the toes, others by the heels. Whatever message you're praying in, there should be an understanding of how it is that people line up for prayer. So you make sure that you're in line. Uh, but it's not an obligation, definitely, to make your feet touch their feet. Um, and um, uh, usually in most of the places that I've been is that, um, even though with some of those narrations that some of the companions used to do that, is that uh, the sunnah remains of just keeping your feet a hand span apart, whether you touch the people's feet or not. Yeah. No, they should touch. Shoulders should touch. Yeah. yeah. Shoulders should touch. Um, I had a question regarding the inner states of prayer. Um, one of the, yeah, one of the things I've struggled with is like what to think about or like how to feel throughout the stages of the, the prayer and what would you say is like for like newbies that are, or people who tend to get distracted easily, like I guess we're seeing here that you should be in, have Raja and Haya and I think you talked about that, that at the end you should have some hope as well as fear. And then there's the state of ta'zim. What's like for people who are starting and to progress, like what's like one or two states that they could just embody to keep it simple? So to keep it simple, and perhaps Imam Mozadi mentioned those different states ahead of time because they're going to naturally come out throughout your prayer if you're focusing on what it is that you're reciting. Right? So let's say you're, you're reciting the Fatiha, right? And that you're saying, there's definitely going to be ta'adim and exaltation there, right? And then if you say ar-Rahman and rahim that might be a time as well from among the meanings as you're hoping for His mercy. Malik yomidin, oof, that's fear. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in, a feeling of absolute helplessness, akala. And then ihdina sarata muslim, sarata ladina amta alayhim. Again, there's fear and there's hope and that you might even have shame come there about, my goodness, what have I done? And then when you recite a chapter of the Quran, depending upon the chapter, again, different emotions might come out based on what it is that you're reciting. But then in the bowing position, again, that's ta'udin and combined with awe and fear. And likewise in sujood. But then also too, which I'm actually surprised he didn't mention it among those states of the prayer is also love. Love is also that one of the very important inner states of heart. I'm actually surprised I didn't mention it in the prayer uh, because that's definitely a part of this, loving Allah. And as you worship Him, that you have love in your heart for Him and so forth. So if you, the way I would recommend doing it is, now that you know those six things, go back from the beginning, according to the outline here, and see which ones fit in where. And that will kind of help you very practically speaking uh, make that your state as you do those things. Okay. You have to slow down. Well, it's like anything else, right? It's like, again, I always go back to the analogy of sports, right? Um, in order, my game was basketball. If you're going to be a good basketball player, you can't think about what you're doing when you're playing. But you work on your footwork separately. The laborsome part, you just sit there and work on your footwork, work on your footwork, work on your footwork, right? You work on your defense separately and different things in defense, whether you're closing someone out or whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, you're shot, you're working, your free throws are different than when 
uh, you're shooting off the dribble or when you're shooting off of a screen or catch and shoot, like all of those are individual skills. And you might be good at one and not the other. So you have to work on all of those things separately. And then in game time, you have to just hope you have muscle memory and just you can't think about those things. So the same thing is in prayer is that you have to work on it piece by piece. And then the more energy coming, it will come together. Kind of as you, you know, we'll just take let's uh, just do, let's one just do, or two other. Yeah. Okay, we have a couple online as well. Good. Mm -hmm. Let's do the sister. Yeah, and, okay. then, and then we'll take the one right. online. Or, I really uh, liked your suggestion that we pray as a congregation at home. Um, but for those of us with young children, it gets quite distracting. And so if we want to, you know, as mothers, cultivate everything that we learned today, would you recommend we, like, pray in congregation that pray on our own or, like, focus on this in Piyama <laughs> Yeah, my kids are all older now, so it's less of an issue. But I did also have kids that were young. And... Um, one thing is you have to do your best. So we're living in societies where we all we oftentimes can't practice the ideal. And part of learning this is, is at least you make the intention. Ya Rab, I have the intention in my heart to pray every prayer in congregation. Um, and keep in mind, this is also part of the modern world, is that people don't tend to live with extended families. So in traditional settings, there were so many people around, it was very easy to pray jama'ah. Okay? So the, the rule of like only one congregational prayer in your home, uh, is the general rule, but if because of children um, that someone um, prays separate congregations, then that's perfectly fine, and it's actually probably advisable. If you think that having chil the children are in, in, there's not something that you can have them do to keep them quiet during the time of prayer, that it requires that you be with them, then it might be better to have someone watch the children and then that pray a separate congregation after and have other people watch the children after that. And if you can, in the midst of that, have uh, that a second congregation where there's still at least two of you praying, then that's great. And so you try to do, you try to do your best and then try to be creative in terms of how you set up the prayer time, right? Where uh, that there's some type of activity or something like that. Um, and that might be one of the times where you give them minimal use of something of a device, right? And something tasteful, like we shouldn't always use the devices for that, but if you're going to use a device with something tasteful, that might be a time in a limited fashion to do that in. Yeah. Okay, Sheikh. We have a question uh, from some online viewers about praying while flying. Uh, can you give some tips to pray outside at airports or inside airplanes? Also, what if one has to make wudu on an airplane during a long flight other than wearing wudu socks? Is there any other dispensation? Yeah, so um, I've never ever felt comfortable giving, telling people that it's okay to pray standing, uh, to pray, excuse me, sitting on planes. I know you'll find those photos out there. Uh, what I would say is, is that do your best to pray standing. If for some reason, like, yeah, the seatbelt sign is on and you're about to land and the prayer time just came in, then I would say, okay, pray in your seat and then make it up after. Uh, but alhamdulillah, that my wife and kids, we always pray standing on planes, um, unless that for some reason that we're unable to do so, or at least we try to. Um, so I think prayer has to come first. And alhamdulillah, the only planes that I've ever not been able to stand up on it was always a Muslim plane, which is really strange. I've never had a problem ever praying standing on a non-Muslim plane. Um, and I, it's, you know, I think, you know, it is what it is. But I would recommend that, uh, you know, and obviously if you're flying on a smaller plane from like a smaller city to another smaller city, it might not be possible to stand up. If that's the case, you pray sitting and then you make up your prayer after. Uh, so I would say that try first and foremost to, even if you have to pay a little bit more, to select your flights according to prayer, okay? So last time I was here, that we ended up flying back and we did a red-eye flight, but we realized is that we would have to pray Fajr on the plane. So we went through Chicago intentionally, so Fajr came in, we prayed Fajr, and then caught the connecting flight after that, uh, and there, it worked out that way. And so try to arrange your flight schedule so that you can pray. Give prayer, you know, preference. 
And oftentimes we can do that. Uh, so then, uh, let's just say you're traveling to like Australia, it's like the classic one for me, it's because you end up going to have to pray like four or sometimes five prayers on the plane. Um, you still have to pray. And it's fairly easy to determine the Qibla based upon the flight maps. Uh, and you determine the Qibla, and if there's a place for you to pray, just ask them kindly, say, I need to pray. And usually that it's facilitated. And that yes, it's very good for both men and women to invest in a pair of wudu socks. There's many kinds now. They used to only be available in like uh, some Islamic bookstores and stuff, but now they're even on uh, Amazon, like Randy Sun is a good brand. Uh, and they all seem to probably have the same, uh, they just probably relabel them, seem to be the same manufacturer. Anyhow, uh, I would invest in a pair of those, make sure you have wudu when you put them on, and then it's so much easier. Uh, but even then, like, if you have to make wudu and put water on your feet, I, I would just recommend just getting the floor wet. So just make wudu, right? Uh, getting the floor a little bit wet, and then just drying it at the end. Definitely dry it. And so what I, I, the times that I've had to wash my feet in the plane, you just put water in your hand, put your foot over the toilet, wash your foot again, use water again, and then it's totally doable. And then at the end, make sure you clean it up so you don't leave it dirty. You just wipe it all up, uh, and it's possible to do, although it's a little bit difficult. Uh, the only plane I've seen that has a drain is Saudi Arabian Airlines, which is really nice, because then they actually have a drain in the ground because they know people are making wudu on it, which is really helpful. Um, but that's what I would recommend, uh, is to plan your prayers, uh, plan your flights accordingly, and then to try to remain in a state of wudu if possible, wear socks, uh, find a nice place, and that prayer your prayer is standing, definitely, if you're able to do so. One more, two, one more? Uh, maybe one last one. One last one, okay. This brother was asking. Salam Shaykh, Jazakallah Khair. A question towards uh, dua. Once we finish the prayer, uh, back if we are in Jama, like uh, what, what we have seen is a couple of times back home, like people make a long dua and a short dua, sometimes they skip it. So, what's the rule and what's the recommendation? After prayer? After prayer. Yeah, it's a great time to make du'a. That's a, a, a very blessed time. And th these are the same times where you have different schools of thought that permit different things. And then that there's beautiful culture that comes into play here as well, uh, which is not in conflict with the religion. So these things are in general very good. And I would recommend kind of going with the flow in terms of whatever is the way of doing things in the particular locale uh, that you are. And, um, you know, hopefully that will uh, start to develop more and more here. And that we have to recognize is not, not every cultural manifestation is wrong. Some of them are valid, that legally valid, um, that uh, in acceptable manifestations of, of uh, good innovations. So there's a lot of room there, but in general, this is a very good time, you know, to, to make dua. And um, it's, you know, throughout the Muslim world, this is a time that you see people in prayers right after they. Yeah, so that could be something uh, that, uh, you know, I don't know the specific reason for that particular manifestation, uh, but um, that it's dua, you know, so dua is a good thing. Right? And what is the specific reason for after Fajr and after Asa? I'm not sure. But again, our tradition is vast, and we, we want to be very careful not to deny certain things. So I don't know the exact answer to your question, but I've seen enough diversity of ways of doing things to not jump to any conclusions. And you know, if you would ask them, you know, especially the scholars among where is this coming from, uh, that they're likely to have you know, a basis for it. Is that